Thank you. The next item of business is debate on motion 8035 in the name of Jean Freeman on the rollout of universal credit. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 12 minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm bringing this motion to the chamber today to allow this parliament to make clear its position on universal credit and to give Parliament the opportunity to show it is on the side of the people being damaged by a system that needs to be halted until it is fixed. Despite repeated requests from people who are suffering under this system, from councils, charities, housing associations and parliamentarians from all parties, most recently 12 Tory MPs and Dame Louise Casey, the UK Government continues to shamelessly ignore calls to halt the rollout of full-service universal credit. So let me highlight again why this system must be halted, because of the overwhelming and compelling evidence that the universal credit system is fundamentally flawed, and what is broken must be fixed, because the UK government's reckless behaviour will continue to see more and more people plunged into debt and despair as this service is rolled out unchanged. There are two critical areas of problem. In policy, the inbuilt six-week wait for the first payment runs entirely contrary to the UK government's stated intention for this benefit. Six weeks is a minimum wait, and as we know, and the Westminster Work and Pensions Committee heard, it can often be very much longer. And for the first seven days, there is no payment. Yeah, I will. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Minister uh, for uh, allowing this intervention? Would she then welcome um, the statement made at the Conservative Party conference yesterday, which said there will be a maximum of five days starting? And will she welcome that and say that will improve the system? Minister. Well, actually what was said at the Conservative Party conference, and believe me, I will get to it, was what we already have, and the only new thing that was said was that people would be told up front that they can borrow that money. It is a loan. So I'm not going to welcome something that is as parsimonious as that. Let me continue. Universal credit, the Tories tell us, is meant to mirror employment. But who waits six weeks for their first pay packet? And how many of us can live without money coming in for six weeks? And how much harder is that if you have children or dependents, rent to pay, food to buy and bills to pay? And that ignores, too, the fact that most of those who will receive universal credit when it is rolled out will be in work and will be entitled to this support because of low wages or hours and that they need the additional financial help with costs for children and housing. In truth, the six-week wait was incorporated into the design of universal credit simply to save the UK government money. Saving money by imposing a six-week wait on those who can least afford it. Saving money with scant regard to all the evidence that their Tory policy plunges people already on low incomes into debt, rent arrears and, in some cases, homelessness. More and more people forced to rely on food banks and emergency grants. This is not just a problem for Scotland, but across the whole of the UK. Frank Field, the MP and Chair of the Work and Pensions Committee at Westminster, recently called for a Christmas truce on what he described as the human and political catastrophe that is the rollout of universal credit. Last week, I joined forces with COSLA to again call for a stop to the rollout of full-service universal credit. We presented detailed evidence about the impact it has on people and local authorities, which is frankly staggering. It shows that in East Lothian, one of the first areas in Scotland to go live with full service universal credit, average rent arrears for tenants in receipt of the benefit is £1,022, compared to 390 for those in receipt of housing benefit, almost three times higher all making it difficult for tenants to find and keep a home. Those rent arrears bring not only worry and hardship on tenants, they also pose real problems for social landlords looking to invest in the further house building that we need. 
And for those four local authorities where the full service is in place in Scotland, administration costs have risen in total to over £830,000. No local authority should have to cover the failings of a UK government from their own budgets. Time and again, this UK government shirks their responsibilities and expects others to pick up the pieces. This is their mess and they should own it and fix it. As the Labour amendment highlights, universal credit is not only flawed in policy, it is overly complicated in its application, carries a high risk of administrative errors and is digitally exclusive, disadvantaging many. In the face of this evidence, from national and local government, third sector organisations, the Church of Scotland and others both north and south of the border, the UK government is still refusing to pause and fix the system. So to address the major concerns of debt and crisis, highlighted by even his own MPs, what action has the current Secretary of State for Work and Pensions taken? He will refresh guidance so that advance payments are offered up front. The very fact of saying even as little as that is to acknowledge that the minimum six-week wait creates hardship. So very little and so very late. So where he has failed, let's see if the Prime Minister will take action. If she wants to support the just about managing as she describes them, then one clear and simple step she can take is to halt the rollout of universal credit. Not advance payments, which are loans to be repaid and over time frames that simply continue the problems, but get her government to fix a broken system it created and one that pushes people way beyond just about managing and straight into suffering and hardship. Stop forcing people to make decisions about eating or heating, going to a food bank, getting a crisis payment, or wondering if they can feed their children and keep a roof over their head. By its actions and its failure to act, the UK government is not only heartless, it is incompetent. Yes, there was widespread support, for simplifying an overcomplicated benefit system. But that support declined as the cracks in the system were highlighted in the pilot areas and was then squandered by a government that refused to take steps to fix those problems. As early as 2013, the National Audit Office identified serious weaknesses in DWP handling, citing poor governance, poor management and poor financial control. In 2014, the Universal Credit pilot, Pilots highlighted problems with monthly payments and removing direct payments of rent to landlords, all ignored. So while this Scottish Government will use our very limited powers over how Universal Credit is paid and will address this starting tomorrow for new claimants, it's clear that this should have and could have been fixed from the very start. I will. Adam Tompkins. I'm grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention. In the words of the Joseph Rantry Foundation, the current system that Universal Credit is replacing is fragmented and traps people in poverty. If Universal Credit is to be halted, why does the Minister want to retain a system which is broken and which traps people in poverty? Minister. The Joseph Rantry Foundation, which I know Mr Tompkins is very fond of uh, quoting, called on the Conservatives to reverse the two-child limit. I said originally the transition from the current benefits and tax credit system to universal credit was going to result in more people gaining than losing. The reverse is now the case. What I am saying is the UK government system in policy terms and in delivery is fundamentally flawed, is being delivered in, with incompetence and needs to be halted. If you are making thousands of people driven them into hardship and misery. Why continue with that when you can fix the system? It's straightforward and it is beyond my understanding why a government would not listen to all the evidence that's before it and make those changes. This government will make possible the choice that people want of being able to be paid twice monthly and being able to decide whether their rent is paid direct to their landlord, social or private, or to themselves. And we will continue our work on how we address single household payments. 
But let me be clear, we have to pay the DWP for ensuring that people have these choices. We have to pay the DWP to do something that is the right thing to do, that they have been told consistently is what they ought to do, and for years people have told them creates a problem that could be fixed in that way. Media reports at the weekend said that the main architect of Universal Credit, Ian Duncan Smith, didn't want to hear the bad news about failings of the system. His approach was blinkered and he marched on regardless. But he is in fact only one of four Secretaries of State for Work and Pensions since the original white paper on Universal Credit was published in 2011. Not one of them has been brave enough to pause this shambolic system and take the necessary time to fix the problems inherent in the design and the delivery of universal credit. Presiding officer, real leadership comes from listening, from paying attention to evidence and from fixing problems. Real leadership comes from admitting when you've got it wrong, not standing by flawed decisions and forging ahead with the blinkers on. We need, and our people in Scotland deserve, a social security system that puts meaning behind the principles of dignity and respect and that puts people at its heart. I urge every member in this chamber to support this motion and call on the UK government to act now and immediately halt the rollout of universal credit and fix the problems. Please move the motion. I'm sorry, Minister, I don't know whether you moved the motion or not. I don't think... I don't think you moved it. Did you move the motion, please? In my name. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Adam Tompkins to speak to and move amendment 8035.2. Mr Tompkins, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. Universal credit remains the right thing to do. The current system is fragmented and traps people in poverty. The prospect of an integrated benefit system that responds to people's changing circumstances is a prize worth having. Universal credit is an important tool for tackling poverty. Not my words, presiding officer, but those, all of them, of the Joseph Rantry Foundation in April of this year. Enrolling six benefits into one, in being expressly designed so that work always pays, in being a much more flexible system that can be readily tailored to individuals' particular and often changing needs, in all of these ways and more, universal credit is a reform to be welcomed. In comparison with the old system that it is replacing, presiding officer, universal credit is working. More people on universal credit are in work than was the case under job seekers allowance and universal, claim, universal credit claimants are on average staying in work for longer and earning more. Unlike the old system, sorry, unlike universal credit, the old system punished work. The old system failed to get young people into work and the old system subsidized low wages by letting the tax credit bill get completely out of control. So for all of these reasons, and contrary to what the Minister has just said, there should be no going back to any of that. Now, none of this is to say, presiding officer, that universal credit is without its problems. So let me turn and address those directly. It's been said, and we just heard the Minister say it, that the delivery of universal credit is pushing people into poverty. It's driving up household debt, forcing people to rely more heavily on food banks. These are deeply serious concerns. And they are the very opposite of what Universal Credit was designed to deliver. Universal Credit is designed to be a flexible, bespoke, tailored system of social security fit for purpose in the 21st century, and in the 21st century labor market, to make it easier for people to escape a lifetime of welfare dependency and move to the dignity, fairness, and respect that a good job brings. So if the evidence on the ground is that that's not happening, that evidence needs to be taken very seriously indeed. So let's get into the detail of this. It's said that three aspects in particular of the delivery of universal credit are causing problems. First, that payments are made monthly, not fortnightly. Secondly, that the housing element of universal credit is paid to households and not to landlords directly. And thirdly, that new claimants have to wait six weeks, and sometimes it's reported longer than that, before they receive their initial payment. So let me address each of these in turn. Now, the first two issues, monthly payments and payments to landlords, are among the matters that, thanks to the Smith Commission agreement, we in this Parliament can change. And, as we heard from the Minister, these changes have been made. They will come into force tomorrow, uh, and the changes, incidentally, were made with our support uh, in the Social Security Committee. Which leaves, I think, only the third reported problem, delays in the initial payment. And this is something which the Social Security Committee, on which I sit, 
and the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee have written to the DWP about. So let us look carefully at what the DWP has said. On the 1st of February this year, Neil Cooling, the DWP's Director General of the Universal Credit Programme, wrote as follows to the Social Security Committee, and I quote, Regarding rent arrears, many people arrive on universal credit with existing arrears. As he explained in evidence to the committee, it's difficult to isolate the effect that universal credit may be having on that. Mr. Calling told the committee that further work was being undertaken by DWP uh, on this matter, and in March, DWP told the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee that some 76% of universal credit claimants had rent arrears before they went onto universal credit. So yes, there is a problem about rent arrears, but it's not clear from the evidence, and the Minister talked about the evidence, that that problem is being caused by universal credit when 76% of new claimants are already in arrears before they go on universal credit. Happy to give away. Ian Gray. Mr Tompkins, in East Lothian, prior to the entry of the rollout of universal credit, rent arrears had fallen by 20%. On their introduction, they increased by 20 per cent in a single year. The evidence is absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. Mr Tompkins. And, 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 the detail, and the detail of that point was addressed by the DWP in their responses to the Social Security Committee. There was a particular problem in East Lothian, which is one of the first authorities in Scotland where full service uh, was rolled out uh, because of the way in which uh, rent is collected by East Lothian Housing Association and East Lothian Council. And that problem has been addressed, but it did cause uh, delays. Uh, and the member is right about that, but it's been addressed and those delays are no longer are being caused by universal credit. Well on the 14th of March this year, the responsible... No, on the 14th of March this year, the responsible minister, Damien Hines MP, wrote to the Social Security Committee in these terms. I accept, he said, that there are cases where claimants wait longer than five to six weeks before they get the money they are entitled to. There are a number of reasons for this, including verification of housing costs, which is the problem that occurred in particular in East Lothian that Mr Gray just referred to. Now, presiding officer, it is clear from their responses both to our own Social Security Committee and to the House of Commons Work and Pensions Committee, that DWP ministers and officials are aware of these problems and are working hard to address and minimise them. Processes for verifying housing costs have been improved. Budgeting advice is being provided in job centres. Benefit advances are available for new claimants. All of this has delivered a real improvement in the timeliness of payments. The most recent statistics show that nearly 80% of new claimants now receive their full payment on time. Is that good enough? No, it's not. And that's why the Secretary of State yesterday made two further commitments, both of which the Minister sought to minimise in her remarks, and in particular in her answer to Mr Balfour, but both of which we should welcome. First, that claimants who want an advance payment will not have to wait six, week, six weeks, but five days. And second, that if someone is in immediate need, DWP will fast-track the payment so they will receive it the same day. That's what the Secretary of State said yesterday. That isn't carrying on regardless. That isn't putting the blinkers on, which is what the Minister said. That is taking into account the evidence and making significant changes to the operation of Universal Credit so that it is safe to be rolled out, which is exactly what's happening. So to conclude, if I have time. There is time for interventions for everybody in this debate. Minister. Will Mr Tompkins accept that the DWP's own information uh, released this year shows that one in four of new UC claimants wait longer than six weeks, half of them need a DWP loan, it is a loan, this advance payment, it needs to be repaid, to pay for food and energy while they wait, nearly one third borrow from family or friends, and most disturbing of all, one in turn turn to payday or doorstep lenders. Now tell me that giving people that loan on the, f the first day or within five days that they then have to pay back does not simply prolong their problems in terms of debt and arrears. Tell me that that is a really a good way in the face of all the evidence from local authorities across Scotland that that is the way to address the six week wait. I think not, Mr Tompkins. Mr Tompkins. More of a speech than uh, a question, but the, 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 well, the, answer, is, the answer is straightforward. It's, a loan, it's an interest-free loan which needs to be paid back over the course of a six-month period. But the point is that claimants in, need, claimants in need are getting the money that they need on the day they make their claim. Not five days later, not six weeks later, but on the day they make their claim. So to conclude, presiding officer, and to address directly the minister's point, it is more important that the DWP gets this right 
than that universal credit is rolled out by any particular deadline. And the UK government can hardly be accused of rushing this. This completion date, the completion date for the universal credit rollout has already been put back to 2022. Getting it right is more important. Should the DWP carry on with its rollout regardless of the concerns about the delivery of universal credit that have been raised? No, and that is not happening. DWP should continue to address and resolve these concerns as universal credit is being rolled out. That's what the Secretary of State committed to yesterday, and we should welcome it. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley to speak to move amendment 8035.4. Mr Rowley, six minutes or thereabouts. Thank you, President Officer. When the Parliament last discussed universal credit a few weeks ago, I said I would welcome a government debate on this issue, so I am glad to be speaking in this today, debate today to move Labour's amendment and to support the government motion. Where, as a parliament, we can work together, we should. And on such an issue, which is having such a negative impact on the health and well-being of so many people in Scotland, I am glad that there is a majority of parties across this chamber who are working together in their efforts to stop the rollout of universal credit. I would also like to acknowledge the work of Citizens Advice Scotland in highlighting the major flaws and for building the campaign to stop the rollout. A campaign that has been supported by 24 Scottish charities, including Shelter Scotland, Oxfam Scotland, Children in Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, Coalition of Carers Scotland, Enable Scotland, and the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Add to this the churches, the trade unions, and the many more organisations getting in touch with MSPs, and I think it is fair to say that Scottish civic society, indeed the majority of Scotland, is now calling on the Westminster Government to stop the rollout of universal credit and sort out the problems. This debate is timely, for we have seen updates from Tory party conference this week on the issue and increased coverage in the news as the full extent of the prob problems become even more evident, even evident to all it would seem apart from the Tories. I note that the intervention from the Working Pension Secretary this week announces that people claiming universal credit who are struggling to pay their bills will now be able to get a cash advance up front on the day they claim. However, this is not a solution to the problems inherent in the structural setup of universal credit. It is a stick and plaster solution trying to hide the problems that have been happening across the rollout areas up and down our country. Across the pilot areas, we have seen a large rise in rent arrears, an almost doubling of crisis grants and massive increases in the need to depend on charity for that most basic necessity, the ability to feed ourselves and our families. How on earth can this be ignored? It cannot. But the Working Pension Secretary, by making this latest commitment, clearly recognises that there is a problem with the six-week waiting period for payment. Yet, instead of calling a halt to the accelerated rollout, he is committed to carrying on regardless. He is ignoring calls from civic organisations across the country, opposition politicians, and now even a number of Tory MPs who have added their names to the list of those calling for the halt of the rollout. When we debated this last, I said, why would any government in a civilised society continue to roll out a new policy that it knows is going to hurt tens of thousands of people, will drive people into debt and towards relying on charity to feed themselves, and will result in even more people in our country being driven into poverty? I ask the very same questions today. This Tory government has shown complete contempt to some of the most vulnerable in our society and seems willing to push ahead with no regard to the misery that they are going to inflict. To remind the Chamber, during the summer I wrote to every MP in the UK asking them to support a call to halt the rollout of universal credit. 
I wrote to the Work and Pensions Secretary, who, in fairness, got back to me and replied, but his defence of the rollout stated that the evidence from Citizens Advice Scotland was based on evidence from a self-selecting group of people. I take it he meant the very people who have experienced being part of the rollout. I also wrote to the leader of the Scottish Tories, Ruth Davison, but today have had no response. The Tories here in Scotland seem to want to bury their heads in the sand. Do they really not care about what is happening to those suffering under this policy as it rolls out across Scotland? Yet again, yep. I thank uh, the, the member for allowing this inter intervention. Does the member agree with me that the best way out of poverty is to work and that people claiming universal credit are 13 per cent more likely to be in work than people claiming job seekers allowance? Alec Rowley. Skills, opportunity and employment are, for me, the best way out of poverty. I wouldn't disagree with that. But, but what we need to do what we need to do is provide the support and help, and what's clear is this proposal in its current form is failing, and that's why we need to address that. We see another weak will defence of the rollout uh, coming from the Scottish Tories here today. The Department for Work and Pensions itself has even recognised that universal credit was a key factor in rent arrears. In a report published just a few weeks ago, official figures show 24% of new universal credit claimants wait longer than the six-week period um, to be paid in full, causing many to fall behind on their rent. With these facts available to them, why then are they still so confident in pushing ahead with this failed system? What is important for people who will suffer as a result of the rollout is that the Tories in Westminster and here in Scotland face up to the issues and call for a halt to the rollout until the design and implementation of universal credit is fixed. The evidence, presiding officer, is overwhelming. How many more reports do the Tories need to see before they realise that they cannot just ignore this? Or are they a government willing to drive its people into poverty? Listen to this parliament today. Listen to civic organisations up and down Scotland. And most importantly, listen to the people that are suffering as a result of these actions, the people that have experienced the pilots in areas up and down Scotland. I urge the Tories, halt the rollout of universal credit. Listen to the people. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I call Alison Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 8035.1. Ms Johnson, six minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. This is the second time in less than a month that the Parliament has debated the rollout of universal credit. And that is, I think, a clear reflection of the extraordinary level of concern our constituents and their representatives here, or most of them, have regarding this very significant change in the social security system. Greens support the government motion and agree that universal credit rollout should be paused. But whilst the design and delivery of universal credit is clearly a problem, the number of cuts that are being hidden in the transition is equally as serious. Recently, Musselburgh and Haddington's Citizens Advice launched the report Universal Credit in East Lothian, Impact on Client Income. They surveyed all people that came to them for help in a two-week period, and results show that 52% of the universal credit recipients surveyed lost money, and 80% of those who lost saw their income drop by more than one-tenth, with an average loss of £44.72 a week. Disabled recipients and lone parents were the hardest hit, which has been a long-running theme of welfare reform under recent UK governments. Disabled recipients surveyed lost up to 20% of their benefit income, with an average loss of nearly £60 a week. It is no surprise, then, that East Lothian Council has been faced with significantly increased demand for support, with applications for Scottish Welfare Fund crisis grants being 20% above what would usually be expected. In 2016-17, there was a 12% increase in council tenant rent arrears, but for universal credit claimants, the figure was almost double at 22%. 
These are figures from one area, but they accurately reflect the bigger picture. This is that universal credit is on average, and I'm quoting, now less generous on average than the tax credits and benefit systems that it replaces. And that quote wasn't from the Child Poverty Action Group. That quote isn't from Shelter, but from the independent Office for Budget Responsibility. When universal credit was launched, the white paper, which incidentally was called Welfare That Works, not an apt title given the problems with the rollout, it said, no one will experience a reduction in the benefit they receive as a result of the introduction of universal credit. But since then, the value of universal credit has dramatically eroded. We've had the benefit cap, which Scottish Green Party research shows is hitting over 2,700 Scots families with more than 11,000 children impacted. The freeze on universal credit uprating from 2016 to 20. Huge cuts to the universal credit work allowances, which means that a working single parent will lose £554 a year. The two child limit for tax, child tax credits and the abhorrent rape clause. I will. Adam Tompkin. Very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. One of the recent changes to universal credit, of course, has been the change in the uh, taper rate from 65% to 63%, which even the Scottish Government said in June of this year has a positive impact. A positive impact. Does the uh, member agree with that? Alison Johnson. Um, yes, I agree, but this amounted to 0.7 billion compared to an initial £3 billion cut. Research by the OBR shows that by 2020, universal credit will take around 3.1 billion out of the pockets of the UK's poorest families. Some estimates are even higher. Our report from the Child Poverty Action Group and the Institute for Public Policy Research suggest that two parent families with children will be worse off on average by 960 pounds a year in 2020 compared with the income they could have expected in the absence of cuts to universal credit and single parent families by a staggering £2,380 on average. The White Paper also promised that 900,000 people, including 350,000 children, would be lifted out of poverty. The Child Poverty Action Group claims that the opposite is the case, with universal credit putting around 1 million children across the UK into poverty. I have mentioned these figures in the chamber before and I am doing so again and I will keep repeating them until MSPs on the Conservative Party side of the chamber and the UK government understand the damage they are doing to so many families and their children. I'd like to turn to the issue of the waiting time for universal credit. Universal credit is paid monthly. Currently there's a seven day waiting period and a further seven day period for the payment to be made. This makes up for a waiting time, at best, of up to six weeks. A built-in delay. How on earth have we come to design a system with a built-in delay of that length? The UK government's justification for this is that universal credit mimics work by paying monthly. Well, leaving aside the rather patronising idea that people requiring support with their income need to be taught what work is like, the comparison is flawed. Many jobs still pay on a fortnightly or a weekly basis, and very few, if any, jobs require the employee to wait for six weeks to be paid. And employers can't simply pay someone weeks late with impunity, but this is what happens with universal credit, with payments coming in seven, eight, nine weeks late and even later, putting huge strain on universal credit recipients and the services trying to help them. In areas where universal credit has been rolled out, Citizens Advice Scotland report a 15% in rent arrears compared to a national decrease of 2%, an 87% increase in crisis grant issues compared to a national increase of 9%. These figures should give members on the Conservative benches pause for thought. The Scottish Government are right to call for the pause of universal credit, as indeed the Greens have done several times, and we will be supporting the motion at decision time today. We do support simpler single benefit payment universal credit, the, the premise of that, but not when that payment is already insufficiently low, lower than many of our citizens need, and not when that payment is less by hundreds, sometimes thousands of pounds. And the analysis I've offered today is shared by groups across the political spectrum. The Resolution Foundation, chaired by Conservative, Conservative MP and former Minister David Willits, argues that universal credit is now different to the original proposal because of Increasingly tight financial restraints placed on it over recent years. These have involved more than just a reduction in the money available under universal credit. They've altered the very structure of the policy, changing the composition of winners and losers and fundamentally damaging its ability to deliver against its purported aim. 
I will round up, um, presiding officer. The UK government should pause the rollout of universal credit and rethink the cuts that are being made within it. With child poverty costing the UK economy billions a year, even viewed in the narrow fiscal terms so beloved by the UK government, universal credit makes absolutely no sense. The cuts to it make no sense. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I call Alec Paul Hamilton to speak to move amendment 8035.3. Mr Hamilton, six minutes thereabouts. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the Scottish Government's motion today and the opportunity it affords this chamber to call a halt to the botched accelerated rollout of universal credit. It follows a successful member's debate last month in the name of Alex Rowley. I was very proud to speak in that, and it drew support from all but one corner of this chamber. In that debate, I remain, reminded this place of the origins of social security in the 1940s, when that great liberal William Beveridge first identified the original giant evils of ignorance, idleness, squalor, want, and disease. Now, that language is outdated, but the challenge that it speaks to still, in many ways, grips large sections of the people we are elected to serve. Welfare reform has itself been a necessary response to the shifting nature of these social problems and the emerging understanding that through state support we can and should give people the power to change their own situation for the better. It was something sought by poverty campaigners, third sector organisations and academics over the course of decades and it fell to my party in its period of coalition government to co-preside over this much needed redesign. Now I am not wholly proud of everything we did in coalition and there are aspects of it I still find shameful. But the extent of the Conservative assault on welfare states since they found themselves unencumbered of liberal influence should lead to an understanding of the measure of our positive involvement. The accelerated rollout of universal credit is an empirical example of where process and ideological drive to reduce the size of the state have held sway irrespective of the misery that now lies in its wake and there has been misery. And the difficulties reported by organisations like the Child Poverty Action Group go even beyond that. Where people switching over to universal credit have had to endure the six week wait and more before receiving their first payment. Where calculations result in underpayments of benefits due to inaccurate real time recording of information. And where online applications have simply disappeared without trace. And each of these inadequacies, presiding officer, we can see a toll which is exacted on families that in turn exerts a material risk to their well-being. So I rise today in support of the government motion, recognising that it gives voice to the intolerable human cost that the flaws in accelerated rollout have caused. I'm grateful for the government's efforts to seek some consensus in the conduct of today's debate, and the Liberal Democrat amendment seeks only to strengthen the government position, and it does so in three key ways. Firstly, it seeks to ensure that those who are moving over to the universal credit are supported to do so. We must offer them comprehensive advice and continuing support on managing money and how to deal with problems in the application process itself as they arise. This in turn should be underpinned by free, unrestricted access to the universal credit helpline, particularly for the duration of the rollout. And finally, and most, perhaps most importantly, it seeks to affirm that consensus which exists across benches in this chamber behind the view that splitting payments across households is an essential development in the evolution of welfare reform. I know I stand on common ground with the government and other parties when I state belief, my belief and that of the Liberal Democrats that in the rollout of a new system such as this, we have an opportunity to blockade a tool of coercive control that has characterised domestic abuse in this country across generations. Put simply, Deputy Presiding Officer, splitting payments equally across every claimant in the household, as the government have committed now to do, might go some way to help remove money as a lever of that control. It's a key characteristic in nearly 90% of abusive relationships. Now, it won't rid our country of abuse, but it represents a frontier in the battle towards its eradication. And coupled with other efforts, such as the legislation passed by this parliament last week, would bring us a step nearer to that aim. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, with 25 different stakeholders, experts in poverty and social injustice, calling us to halt this process, we as a parliament must surely listen. We must also be clear that this resistance to accelerated rollout is not a fundamental objection to the principles of welfare reform, but rather a just reaction to the unintended impact of its introduction. It answers the challenge set to us by that Liberal William Beveridge when he said that the state in organising security should not stifle incentive, opportunity or responsibility. In establishing a national minimum, it should leave room and encouragement for voluntary action by each individual to provide more than that minimum for himself and for his family. In short, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is the belief of these benches and Liberals through the ages that welfare in this country should be constructed on foundations of compassion and social mobility. We should seek to use it as a tool of liberation from poverty, from social isolation and from domestic abuse. And if in its rollout we harm those citizens, it is designed to serve as we appear to have done in this case then we must cease its introduction until that can be remedied. As such, Deputy Presiding Officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes. Time for interventions. I call Sandra White to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms White, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And before I, I start my speech, I really think it's important that we remind people, and particularly the Tories, that these are people, uh, real people, human beings, that we are discussing today and the situation. It's not statistics, it's real people. And I do find it absolutely abhorrent that those uh, who are most in need are being penalised by a system that should be providing for them. Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree with the call for the universal credit rollout should be stopped immediately. And I do reiterate the concerns of the House of Commons uh, Working Pensions Committee, which has been mentioned by, I think, every other speaker today, which has actually highlighted the fundamental flaws of universal credit. And I think we need to realise that as well. Universal credit has been a shambles since its inception, and the report produced by Citizens Advice Scotland lays bare a system which really isn't fit for purpose. Really, the evidence is damning. This system is actively pushing people into crisis through the six-week wait for payment and the knock-on effects such as rent arrears, not just to them, but obviously to the Housing Association also, which cannot actually invest in you know, other members and other uh, residents of the housing associations. It really is a two-pronged situation uh, for everyone, but it's the people who are absolutely suffering, suffering from it. They are unable to buy food, and pay other bills such as gas and electricity. What kind of society do we think we're living in if that's what we're putting people through? Now, a Glasgow uh, CAB reported that a client with long-term depression and the receipt of universal credit was having £95 recovered from their payments of a hardship loan and £31 for rent arrears, leaving them £190 a month to live on. The CAB contacted DWP to renegotiate the repayments for the hardship loan, but they were told they're, they're non-negotiable. And if I can just give another couple of examples of advanced payments so lauded by the amendment by the Tories and Adam Tompkins, who moved it. Let's just look at the so-called five days or whatever it may be. It's not money in kind or money being given. In kindness, it's a loan, which we keep saying it's a loan. What kind of society or government gives a loan to somebody who's desperately needing the money and might have to be homeless if they don't get it? We've got to repay it back. Loan repayments automatically deducted from the universal credit so the total amount is paid back. Must provide a breakdown of what the advance is for and how it will prevent damage to health and safety. There's only one advance per person. And I know Jeremy Balfour is talking about, I can hear him in the background or someone else, uh, can be refuse the payment. Basically, if you don't face serious hardships, you're close to receiving, or you cannot afford to repay the loan. I ask once again, it is a loan. It is not money which has been given out of the goodness of the government's heart. The system itself is designed to exclude the most vulnerable, and that's the evidence which has been gathered from citizen advice offices across the country. And it's shown that whilst the DWP want to have a totally digital service, 
a quarter of those consulted would be confident in using this kind of service. And I know that's highlighted in Alec Rowley's amendment from the Labour Party. By implementing this process and accessing support, they're marginalising a huge number of claimants. Not everybody has the technology or the experience of computers to be able to access that as well. Now, another case from Glasgow CEB, a prime example of the inadequacies in this digitally driven system. A client who had tried to make a claim for universal credit admitted they struggled to meet the online obligations expected of claimants due to not really knowing what they were doing. The outcome was the client was without any income for 10 months. 10 months just because they could not access it through the fact that they did not know how to use the actual uh, methodology. Not to mention the fact they were staying with family but felt uncomfortable because they could not contribute financially. The administration of the system has been attacked, and rightly so, and I refer to the case I have just outlined previously. Members will not be surprised to hear that there are many, many more. Glasgow CAB reported one case of a client providing all the required information for the claim, but due to the DWP not processing all of the information, they had to wait a further two weeks before the claim was processed. That's not an isolated incident, presiding officer. That has come through time and time again. And the Social Security Committee has heard of this evidence when we visited out with the Parliament in that respect. So it's little wonder that people are calling for a halt to this particular system. We are not saying that the system that was previously there was perfect, because it wasn't. But what we are saying is the fact, and everyone here apart from the Tories are saying, the fact of the matter, universal credit is punishing people. People are suffering greatly and we really need to halt it. And I ask the Tories, which obviously probably will fall in deaf ears, but we ask them to support this motion tonight because people are really suffering through it and they are human beings. The system's a disgrace and I fully support the recommendation from the third sector and others that the rollout cannot go ahead until the serious flaws which have been highlighted by everyone in the system are rectified. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And uh, can I welcome the amendment in my colleague's name and fully uh, support it. I suspect there's got, going to be a lot of consensus um, from other parties in regard to what we're going to say uh, this afternoon. But I think we can surely all agree that what we want to see here in Scotland is as many people um, as possible uh, get into employment. And we had a debate here in the chamber uh, at a, under a private member's bill last week um, where I raised the whole issue of uh, disability and the lack of disabled people getting into employment. And universal credit is designed to help people get into employment. And I think we need to keep remembering that that has to be our goal and our aim. We've heard, uh, not at the moment, I've got, I'll make some progress if it's actually okay. We've heard so much about this great old system that we all love so much. Six forms, six claims, six different payments, all which caused people confusion and difficulty. And the system needed the form. In fact, my understanding up until perhaps today, that every political party here in Scotland wanted to see change. And yet here we have today is simply we want to go back to a system that failed people and didn't work. We've heard a lot, again, from... No, I'm going to make some more progress, that's OK. We've heard um, a lot today from both the Minister and from Sandra White about the IT issues and how it, that causes people problems. And I recognise that for many people, including myself, a bit of a Luddite, that IT is difficult to get your head around. But again, if you go to Musselburgh Job Centre, where this has been rolled out, and you speak to the staff there, they are helping people to fill that out. East Lothian Council are running training for people to be able to use IT free of charge in the library, which not only, no, which not only allows them to fill out the forms, but gives them expertise in the area that they don't already have. So the principle is right, and it's helping people into employment. Again, we've heard a lot about uh, this being a loan 
that people get a loan. And I agree, it is a loan. When I first started my first job, I went to work for four weeks and I didn't get paid for those four weeks. My mum and dad gave me money to get me over my rent and for what, let me finish up. Can I just finish the point? Let me just finish that point and I will come and give away. My mum gave me money for four weeks to help me survive. You know what? You know what? She then wanted that money back. How outrageous of her to give me a loan and then ask money for back. And that is absolutely the same that happens here. What we've got here is that we've heard a statement from a minister at the party conference, Conservative Party conference yesterday where he said that if somebody goes in, they will get that money on the day and yes, they will have to pay it back over a six month period. Why is that wrong? Why is that unfair? Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Jeremy Balfour for taking intervention. Mr Balfour's comments a moment ago spoke about this loan, but Mr Balfour, someone who's on universal credit or applying for universal credit, they're not applying for a job. They're applying to get assistance so they can live, so they can eat, so they can feed their families. Jeremy Balfour. And that is why we get the money. And then we pay that money back in a, in, a, in, a, in a way over six months, which they can afford. And that seems to me an appropriate way to work. I think we have seen, and I'd be interested um, if Alex Go Hamilton and his someone up would be interested, because I do welcome the Scottish Government's move to make this two weeks where people want that. I do welcome the move that rent should go to the landlord. I think those are both positive steps that come in tomorrow, and I welcome them. And I welcome a statement by the Minister uh, yesterday in regard to this uh, one day or five day period. So my question to the Liberal Democrats in particular is, what more do you want to change before you allow the rollout to carry on? Because you've said that you agree with it in principle. We are looking at rolling it out slowly so that where there are glitches, it can be... Um, a Sorry. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the question was directed directly at me, I feel compelled to answer. I think several things. Firstly, as the government motion says, the full stop of the rollout until we're absolutely sure that the teething glitches and the IT problems are resolved and the six-week wait is completely annihilated. The second thing is... Uh, free access to the Comprehensive Universal Credit Helpline. And finally, we need to be sure that, that when we do pay payments, that they're split across households so that we can reduce domestic abuse. Jeremy Balfour. I, I welcome um, the member for clarifying that. But unless you roll out the system, unless you roll out these glitches, we'll ne we will never know about them. And that is why the government is taking its time in rolling this out. So I'm, I'm in my last minute. Uh, I'm about to be called up by the Deputy Vice Officer. That is why it is right to continue to roll out, to make the necessary changes, but to be against this in principle is wrong and is holding people back in our country and the other parties should reflect on that. And what, what they're causing is greater poverty and less people getting into disability. I do have a few minutes in hand uh, for interventions. Uh, Christina McKelvey to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you very much, President Officer. What do you do when you have a government in Westminster that admits its own welfare reforms are, and I quote, flawed, mm -hmm. but pushes on with them anyway? What do you do if you don't come from a privileged family background that can bail you out whenever you need it? You get total chaos and devastating doses, wrecking the lives of people mm -hmm. who are easy targets. It's not universal and it's not credit. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who have just got back to me, have said that they want to see an immediate end to waiting days, fortnightly payments, and rent directly to landlords, just like the Scottish flexibilities coming into force tomorrow, and more generous work allowance, and a second earner, earner allowance. This is needed if universal credit is to make work pay, as the Tories say, and better than minor changes to any taper. They also say, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, that we support choice over payment splitting within households, stating that those receiving the child element should be first. And Lord Freud, presiding officer, the architect of universal credit, has already admit admitted that there are faults and he has said that it might take decades, and I quote, decades to optimise the scheme. That won't be a problem. 
But then this is the same Lord Freud in a letter to me who told MND sufferers to take in a lodger or work extra hours in order to cope with the bedroom tax. So you get a view of the man behind the scheme. Then we have David Gock declaring that universal credit is transforming lives. Well, yes, presiding officer, it is transforming lives, but not for the better. Certainly not for the people that I see suffering mm -hmm. coming through my door every single day. And the figures emerging from that transforming lives is in the five areas where we've had the pilots. The cab has told us that a 15% rise in rent arrears is seen. An 87% increase in crisis grants are needed. And two of the five cab areas, 40% and 70% increase in food bank advice. And when Angela Constance wrote to express the Scottish concerns, she didn't even get a, a reply. What she got was a five-page eulogy declaring how wonderful the whole system is. A bit like the letter I got from Lord Freud. It's yet another depressing example of the Conservative attitude to people who are in any kind of need. That Oliver Twist attitude that we've heard of today. You want more, you won't get more from the Tories. We have already seen them attacked with the bedroom tax. We've been making those on DLA face humiliating interviews. We've seen a loss and cuts in payments and demands that they are fit to return from, to work. Presiding officer, in Hamilton, Lackall and Stonehouse, I have a constituent who is unable to leave his home and is relying on a multiplicity of drugs. He has been told to go and stack supermarket shelves. He can't even leave his wheelchair unaided. Another example of the conscious cruel cruelty of this Tory UK yes. government. People are told that universal credit only affects means-tested benefits. Even that much isn't true. In complex cases, for example, where there is an enhanced care component for a disabled child, the families are set to lose thousands of pounds a year. And if you have a second disabled child, that will double. And Citizen Advice Scotland have also told us in their analysis of 52,000 cases that they calculate that those on universal credit would have less than four pounds per month to spend after paying their bills. Four pounds a month. People in here spend more of that on a smoothie. The organisation also found that the system has been rolled out in Scotland. There has been an 87% increase in crisis grants, as I said earlier. 87% increase in crisis grants. That's local authorities picking up the pieces of people's lives on a benefit that's been cut by Westminster. That's not acceptable. Since the Scottish Government introduced this scheme to provide some mitigation, it has paid out £132.6 million. That's just a stick in plaster. That won't solve the problem. But that's £132.6 million not spent on frontline services. And universal credit, as we've heard, has brought with it rent arrears that have rocketed, making eviction a constant threat. In East Lothian, we've heard some of the horror stories from there. In South Lanarkshire, presiding officer, where universal credit will roll out this week, the, the council have had to put by four million pounds just to deal with the rent arrears. Four million pounds, an additional to the 132.6 million pounds not been spent on frontline services. As politicians, as representatives of our communities, we cannot stand on the sidelines silent. Presiding officer, I welcome that the Scottish Government has managed to secure a system that allows some flexibility to make more frequent pay payments, but we are having to pay for that. Something that has been welcomed by charities and voluntary organisations. Hopefully, that will help contain some rent arrears and make very limited incomes a bit easier to manage. But that is also a stick and plaster, not a cure. Amongst the, the, the multiple de design flaws that this Scottish Government has managed to fix, only two of them. This is a turnaround in time for applications. We need to fix that turnaround. I have people waiting six weeks. Yes, we do. We have people waiting six weeks. However, the brilliant volunteers at the Hamilton District Food Bank in my constituency are telling me that people are waiting up to 12 weeks long. They have seen young men who have been subject to this in South Lanarkshire for 12 months, who are rough sleeping, who are sofa surfing, who are unemployed, who are... Um, self-harming and in some cases attempting and being pretty successful at suicide. That is not something that I will remain silent on. Food banks where the system has already been rolled out are seeing a double in the number 
that they'd see, they've seen pre previously. And it doesn't take a genius to work out where that's going to lead us with 50 more rollouts. Yet this government is determined to ignore that evidence. I say to Theresa May and David Gock, admit it and accept the figures. You've got it wrong and it's going to get much, much worse. Accept reality and stop the rollout towards oblivion. You need to rethink and put people at the centre of your plans instead of putting them on the streets. Pauline McNeill, followed by George Adam. Presenting officer. Can there really be any doubt now that the way that the universal credit system has been rolled out is pushing more people into poverty. It seems that even people on the other side of the debate at least agree that it has not rolled out the way in which it was intended. Tonight I will vote for Alec Rowley's motion and with all the other political parties to make our voice heard in this parliament, to join with other political parties to say that universal credit, as it is currently being rolled out, should be halted so that the serious flaws in it can be resolved. Because the Tories should not misunderstand the position of Labour or any other party. We are not, Jeremy Balfour wouldn't take an intervention, but if he had, me and many others would say, well, not one of us got to our feet to defend the current system. To a member, we have asked for the halting of the current system so that it can be fixed. The Citizens Advice Bureau call for the freeze of the universal credit system. Carry on, Many Sue. other organisations that I, I just wanted to have some uh, silence so I could speak. The Citizens Advice Bureau and many other organisations that deal with people who are at the receiving end of universal credit, day and daily are we doubting when they add their voice to call for the freeze of this policy. But you see, the universal credit scheme that we are debating is not as advertised. Yes, it was to create flexibility in the benefit system to get people back to work without losing their benefits. I think it was Alison John Johnson who I think eloquently outlined it. The transition for many people has not been like that. In fact, there's evidence to support the idea that people have had less money under universal credit than the previous system. The truth is that the current operation of universal credit for most people has been a swindle and it's not the scheme that they were promised and it now is discredited because the Tories refuse to really fix the fundamental problems that would make it a scheme worth defending. So we were told earlier on in the debate that uh, rent arrears were caused by the previous system and not universal credit. But the DWP's own evaluation found that 42% of all claimant families that are waiting for a first universal credit payment were in rent arrears because of that. In fact, four in 10 households were in rent arrears eight weeks after the claim. So it is grossly unfair to say that it's because of rent arrears collected um, under the previous system. Well, let's see what the five day payment that's just been announced. This is the only response we've had to promises even made by the Prime Minister only this week that she accepted that there were problems in the system. Let us see whether that resolves any of the deep-rooted problems. But you see, for most people, they know that this will have a knock-on effect in wider society. Because when people are unable to pay their rent and landlords don't get receipt of that rent and so on. And I think there has to be an acceptance that a failure to fix this will have a much wider problem in society. And let's not forget that we're talking here at the moment that universal credit is expected to be accelerated. When we are calling for a halt, the government want to accelerate it. <coughs> now, I would at least have some respect for the Tory position tonight if you said that at least you were asking for the system to be slowed down so that the flaws could be fixed. But instead, you seem to be supporting that it is, in fact, accelerated, even with all the flaws 
that it has. The six week built in, and it doesn't seem to be a six week built in, uh, designed um, to make it difficult for claimants. And it's obvious, I think, to anyone, that if you change the support system for those who are already struggling by adding in extra time where they don't get paid, it's obvious to anyone that they are going to reach a crisis point. But areas with full universal credit rollout have seen an 87% increase in crisis grant issues compared to a national increase of 9%. I mean, can anyone be in any doubt about that? Every part of the country is reporting deep-rooted errors. So it isn't just that the system's not working, but da daily errors in the system itself. Now, let's not forget that it's a move to a fully digital system. Now, some of us, or maybe not, may be fully uh, conversant with a digital system. But Jeremy Balfour, it isn't just that people can't get their head around it. The problem is that many people can't afford to be on the internet in the first place. So why would you design a system and not make allowances for the one in four people, for example, in Glasgow, who don't even have access to the internet? There is overwhelming evidence from the Citizens Advice Bureau and the Trussell Trust that show that this six week wait in itself does lead to den and rent arrears and the use of food banks. The Church of Scotland presiding officer, and I'll, I'll finish on this if you want me to. Um, I think they had a very important uh, aspect to their briefing to members. So they say that the design choices of the scheme reflect the experiences of wealthier members of society, ignoring the real life experiences um, of those poorer people uh, who are on universal credit. With that presenting officer, I hope at least if the Tories are not going to vote with us tonight, they will do more to speak out, to get these fundamental flaws changed and make the system the kind of system it was meant to be in the first place. George Adam, followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, presiding officer. I am happy to speak in this debate today because it's a simple comparison between what is right and what is quite clearly wrong. The current system for universal credit is broken, as others have said, and must be stopped and fixed. The six-week wait for the first payment of universal credit is pushing people into rent arrears, debt and crisis. And when the Social Security Committee went over to Musselburgh, we heard the real-life stories of people's sufferings, not the Disneyfication of uh, Jeremy Balfour, not the when you wish upon a star ideals of Jeremy Balfour. These were real people with real issues. There was one gentleman who had worked all his life but because of his wife's long-term condition was now her full-time carer. He told that he had rent arrears because of universal credit and was having trouble sleeping with the worry. This is real people with real problems, not some cold, callous academic debate. And as my, San as my colleague and friend Sandra White said, these are people's lives that we're dealing with here in this scenario. But his complaints were that there was no human contact throughout the whole process from the DWP. He showed me a phone tablet that he used uh, as his sole contact source with the DWP. He believed there was no one at the other end of that conversation. He barely had the data allowance to be able to actually send information backwards and forwards. But when he attended the job centre, he he, to talk to someone, to talk to a human being about the problems he was having, he was told that they couldn't help. This is just not right presiding officer. This is a man that, because of his current predicament, doesn't know where, he, where, where or when his next penny is coming from. This is not welfare reform. These are the ongoing attacks by the Tory Westminster government on our most vulnerable within our society. The Scottish government wrote to the UK government back in March 2017, uh, expressing their concerns and stating that their policy was pushing more people into hardship and debt. But, presiding officer, this is not just the Scottish Government and the people of, uh, that spoke to the Social Security Committee in Musselburgh that are saying this. This, is, this call for the, from, the, uh, from the Scottish Government is echoed by 24 Scottish charities. Alec Rowley and Alex Cole Hamilton have mentioned this as well today. It's including Shelter Scotland, SFHA, Homeless Action Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland, Oxfam and the Poverty Alliance, all organisations who are involved with people at the front line in dealing with poverty. In the letter uh, to the Scottish edition of the Times, all 24 charities said, together 
we believe the government must halt the rollout of the benefit so that these flaws can be fixed before they harm more people. Before they harm more people, presiding officer. These are strong words from organisations who normally just want to go about helping people, but they're taking this stance because they know how wrong this uh, policy is. And this is a very important point to make because the evidence of the Social Security Committee particularly has had uh, none of the faults from the pilot programmes were ever corrected. We heard from DWP members who said, or people that worked for DWP, or it was, no, it was actually the Muscle Brothers Social uh, Citizens Advice, they said that they had a problem because the problem was that when they had the pilots, no one fixed the problems. They just kept cutting and pasting it and moving it on. So don't listen to anyone here, and I will not be lectured by anyone who's telling me they're taking their time. They have cut and pasted the whole process all the way through, and that is what's causing most of the problems because of their sheer arrogance. The Social Security Committee has heard the, difficult, uh, the, the difficulty that Universal Credit's had in local authorities. One senior officer from Inverclyde going as far to say that it just needs to stop a council officer saying that it must stop. Now, council officers are aware that they work within a political environment and nine times out of ten are normally very careful in what they say. But this one individual said, in one of the areas where the full rollout is, it had to stop now. So don't take my word for it of, of, these, uh, of the council officer and one of the many difficulties in the rollout figures, uh, rollout difficulty areas. Here's, here's the figures from the DWP themselves. One in four new claimants Want, uh, want, uh, waited longer than six weeks for their first payment. They also found that four out of ten households were in rent arrears eight weeks after their claim was made. One in three are still in arrears four months later, and four, of five, four out of five said they had never, ever, ever been in arrears before in the past. Many took to payday lenders or doorstep lenders, thus making a very difficult situation even worse. In 2016-17, a total of 229,920 2, applications were made to the Scottish Welfare Fund. The UK government must stop ignoring the overwhelming evidence that shows the negative impact of universal credit full service. To make the point further, John Cunningham of East Lothian Council uh, said uh, to the full uh, rollout area, said, now, now that the full service is operating, 82% of council tenants in East Lothian who receive universal credits have some level of arrears. 82% have some level of arrears. And as we know, many of them never had arrears in the past. So closing, presiding officer, the UK Tory government must take heed of this, must take heed of this parliament as well. They need to look at the financial destitution throughout our country caused by their policy. Our communities are suffering as a result of this policy. This is not the way forward. They must think again and stop this rollout of universal credit. Donald Cameron, followed by Marie Todd. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by adding to what some of my colleagues have already said? We accept that the rollout of universal credit has produced some serious anomalies. We accept that there have been instances where some households being transferred to the new benefit have seen an extended period of time before they are in receipt of it, notwithstanding that, as the DWP has said, the vast majority of claimants are paid on time and in full. We accept that inevitably problems will exist when delivering a system of such magnitude. My plea today is that across this chamber, when talking about issues, which affects some of the most vulnerable people in society. We discuss it without hyperbole and with consistency. Universal credit, as Adam Tompkins has said, is working. In yes, indeed. Sandra White. Thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention, and I accept what he has said to an extent. But he also accepts from this side of the chamber, in reply to Jeremy Balfour, that not everyone has either parents, rich parents, or someone that can give them the money to put them over the six weeks waiting, or even the five days. Sorry, you did say that, Mr. Balfour. We can't all, some people can't rely on their parents or others to give them the money. Well, you accept that, that some people really are suffering. Donald Cameron. Of, of course I accept that people are in that position, but independently reviewed research has shown that those who are on universal credit are more likely to move into work in the first nine months of their claim with 71% of claimants doing so 
compared to 63% of those on job seekers allowance. This is in inherently a better system. According to the DWP, there are those who are on universal credit are on average earning more. Whilst we recognize the challenges that a new system presents, the early indications show that it is having the positive impact that is intended to achieve. Let me be clear, are we saying the rollout, no, sorry, I'd like to make some progress. Are we saying the rollout of universal credit has been easy? No, we are not. Are we saying that it is a simple and seamless change? No, we are not. What we are saying is that once fully implemented, not only will universal credit be one of the most necessary overhauls of our welfare system in generations, but it will also deliver better prospects for those who need it most. And rather than talking down this reform package, now I'd like to make some progress, please. We should be discussing what this parliament can do to make it work, and furthermore, what powers we can use to ensure that fewer people require to be on universal credit in the first place. We know that while full universal credit hasn't yet been completely rolled out, the UK government expects all new claimants to be on it by 2018 and all legacy claimants to be enrolled by 2022. This is a long process. In any event, it's not being rushed, and rightly so. It will take a decade. It was first legislated for in 2012. There are another five years to go. Progress should be patient and incremental so that we get this right rather than rush it. And it's simply incorrect to, it's simply incorrect to accuse the UK government of rushing this. We on these benches want to see it work rather than fail. No one has sought to create problems around delayed payments, and the UK government and its agencies will do all it can to ensure those wrongs are made right. And every parliamentarian should be assisting those in our communities who find themselves in such circumstances. And for that reason, like others, I welcome the intervention of the Secretary of State yesterday, who announced that anyone who needs an advance payment will be offered it up front. Claimants who want an advance payment will not have to wait six weeks. They will receive this advance within five working days. And if someone is in immediate need, then the DWP will fast track the payment, meaning they will receive it on the same day. However, I want to turn to a specific issue quickly, which is how universal credit supports young people looking to get on in life. There are a series of exemptions that exist to support the most vulnerable young people in our society, including those unable to live with their parents, people who are in work or those who have left work, and others in difficult circumstances. Now, we know youth unemployment is down across the UK. We know that the Fraser of Allender Institute announced over the summer that youth unemployment in Scotland is at its lowest ever recorded rate. And while such welcome data has occurred for a number of reasons, it's clear that more young people are working than ever before and that universal credit, which is primarily designed to get more people into work, is not having the doom-laden impact that some would have it to do. It's important to remind the chamber, no, I'm not going to take an intervention. It's important to remind the chamber of the good that this can do. With all that said, I want to stress again the significance of this reform, a reform which offers people a hand up, not a hand out, because the principles behind universal credit are positive. Simplifying the welfare system is positive. Ensuring that welfare rewards those who work is positive. Reducing poverty is, of course, a positive. And it isn't just the Conservatives that have advocated this system. It is, isn't just the Conservatives that have advocated this system, Deputy Presiding Officer. Labour MPs have backed it. The Shadow Secretary of Work, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Debbie Abrahams, said that we supported and still support the principles of a simplified benefit system. The Liberal Democrats were in coalition when the UK government passed the Welfare Reform Act. Yet to hear an SNP member call for its revocation. It's coming to a close. So with such wide party political consensus, well let's make this system work, a system that will encourage work, encourage aspiration, and a system that does not trap people in dependency, but instead offers them hope. Yeah. Marie Todd, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'm sorry that Donald Cameron would not take an intervention from me regarding the flaws uncovered in the Highland area that we both represent. It does seem from his speech that he lives in a very alternative world to me and many others in the Highlands. If universal credit continues, food banks won't be able to catch everyone that falls. 
This is the stark warning that the Trussell Trust, which runs 400 food banks across the country, has issued to Theresa May. Charity after charity has lined up to point out what this flawed plan is doing, but the Tories just ignore them. As one of the first areas in Scotland to have universal credit, Highland is already having to deal with the impact of this ill-thought-out policy. And myself and Drew Henry MP have been campaigning for many months to halt the rollout of full-service universal credit. I can assure Mr Balfour that the UK government has heard of the flaws long ago, but they have taken no action. This week, the UK government's own Tory backbenchers are calling for a halt to universal credit. 12 Tory MPs, led by Heidi Allen, have written to Mr Gawke, demanding the national rollout of the policy be paused. Not the Scottish Tories, I presume, but clearly there are some Tories who put their constituents before their party. Dame Louise Casey, who has advised four Prime Ministers on social policy for the past 18 years, including Mrs May, has joined the calls to halt the rollout. Will the Tories ignore her too? Presiding officer, what will it take for the UK government to finally notice the devastating impact that universal credit is having on people? It is scandalous that the Tories defend the rollout of universal credit when they can see the harm that it is causing. There is a damning litany of failure, confusion, heartache, indignity and a crushing drive towards increased poverty in the universal credit system. No, Mr Tompkins. As others have said, one of the main problems is that new claimants have to wait up to six weeks before receiving their first payment, longer in some circumstances. Now I know it is very difficult for those in privileged positions and from wealthy backgrounds to understand, but most ordinary people cannot manage to survive six weeks with no income. And a six week delay is the official best case scenario. In reality, it can be months. Lengthy delays are pushing tenants, building up rent arrears and being pushed to seek crisis or hardship payments and turning into food banks. The rise in arrears, Mr Tompkins, is not just in East Lothian. It is putting real pressure on local authority budgets in the Highland Council. They've set aside £650,000 to deal with the further increase in rent arrears that they're expecting. They have also employed four new staff at a cost of £124,000 to prevent rent arrears. This money-saving exercise seems somewhat costly. Earlier this year, myself and Drew Henry invited the Minister for Social Security in Scotland to a roundtable meeting in Inverness so she could listen firsthand to the evidence of harm. We heard the story of a pregnant woman forced to travel to Aberdeen to get a national insurance number before she could claim any money. We heard the story of many people, many with poor digital skills and connectivity, struggling with no money. We heard how housing associations find themselves in the unenviable position of pursuing tenants through the courts at huge public expense for debt that is not of the client's own making. And we heard staff who worked in the council, CAB and housing associations describing the distress that they feel at being unable to help. The removal of implicit consent means that they can no longer act on behalf of their clients. The client has to navigate the system themselves. The evidence of universal credits failure is there for all to see. The most powerful testimony we heard at that meeting was from Macmillan CAB. They help people who are terminally ill to put their affairs in order before they die. Terminally ill claimant forms cannot be made without the claimant verifying that they are terminally ill. This system forces these people to face up to something they might not want to face up to, something that they have the right not to face up to, if that's what they wish. Terminally ill people, by definition, have limited time. They spend the last months of their lives worrying about their family finances, getting into debt and navigating an impossible system. The general theme 
that folks should be better off working or make work pay is oft repeated by the Tories and underpins the ideology behind universal credit. Presiding officer, I directly challenge my Tory colleagues in this chamber to tell us whether they imagine that terminally ill folk would be better off working. No, it isn't just a problem with implementation. This pol policy is fundamentally flawed in its design. It is not about making work pay. It is about making benefits punish. Universal credit exemplifies the colossal lack of empathy and incompetence, which has become the indelible hallmark of the Tory government. It is time to admit that universal credit is an expensive failure, rolling out the scheme to thousands of people who are already struggling is cruel in the extreme. Stop it. Ian Gray, followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, presiding officer. The idea of universal credit is one which seems to have been around for a very long time. Uh, uh, Adam Tompkins is, is right, really. Its development on the face of it has been painfully slow. You would think then that having taken so long to propose, plan and develop this new system, the Tory government might have got it right. Alas, nothing could be further from the truth. And I know this to be the case because my own constituency in East Lothian was the very first in Scotland to see, or perhaps I should say suffer, the ironically termed full service universal credit rollout, March last year. So. Uh, almost 18 months uh, of real experience. And for my constituents, universal credit has not seemed painfully slow, it's just seemed very painful indeed. And how painful, we now know for sure, because last week my two local citizens' advice bureau in Musselburgh and Harrington published their report, Universal Credit in East Lothian, Impact on Client, Client Income. And this snapshot looked at exactly what had happened to clients' incomes compared to the six legacy working age benefits replaced by universal credit. And the results are stark. There are more losers than gainers, and the losers lose a lot more than the gainers gain. Indeed, 52% of CAB clients in East Lothian lose uh, from the switch to universal credit, only 31% gain. And that, of course, is the reverse of the predicted results and desire uh, of the change. What's more, the median loss in income for those who lose is £44.72 per week, with one client losing as much as £117 from their weekly support. Meanwhile, the median gain for those whose income did increase was 34 pence. The previous analysis uh, by Labour has shown that single parents are going to be worst hit by universal credit and the East Lothian research bears that out. Lone parents lose most. Mm -hmm. However, the research also reveals that disabled clients are hit just as hard as lone parents by the changes. And the truth is that the new system, which was supposed to incentivise work, is instead punishing those who face the greatest barriers, be they caring responsibilities or disability, to finding uh, that work. Uh, and I say to uh, Mr. Tompkins and Mr. Balfour, this is not a benign shift to a new streamlined form of benefit. For my constituents, it has been a straightforward cut in the money they receive to live. And it's worth reiterating, presiding officer, that these are facts, not speculation, evidence of the real uh, impact. And that research clearly demonstrates the effect of the six-week wait for benefits under universal credit too. Sure. Adam Tompkins. Grateful to the member for taking an intervention. As he, as he will well know, the Social Security Committee visited Musselburgh in his East Lothian constituency to look at the rollout of universal credit there. And this is what we found. Attendees, claimants and advice workers were supportive 
of the theory of universal credit and its aims. There was recognition that it was a new system and everyone was learning. And one CAB advice worker said that having all six benefits assessed at the same time and having a real-time system were improvements. I wonder if Mr Gray could reflect on those remarks. Ev Ian evidence Gray. from his own constituency. Well, well, I'm happy to reflect on them and I hope I get some time back for them uh, as well because they were quite lengthy. And I hope Mr Tompkins will reflect on the evidence here that no matter uh, how happy those people he met may have been with the form filling, the net effect of the change to universal credit is a reduction in living standards for the vast majority of those accessing uh, the benefits system. Uh, and uh, uh, that too, uh, partly caused by the six week uh, wait, the worst wait reported to CAB in East Lothian, in Musselburgh Job Centre area, was six months, not six weeks. And these are having real effects on real people. This is not Mr Cameron's hyperbole. They have real effects. In East Lothian, we saw a 34% increase in referrals to the food bank, the highest increase in referrals in any part of Scotland. So the consequences of forcing people to prioritise between feeding their families and paying other bills is, uh, are real and are there and uh, can be demonstrated. I've already said to Mr Tompkins that we've seen in East Lothian a 20% increase in rent arrears. And he may tell me that DWP tell him that this has been resolved. I would say that if he comes to East Lothian Council, they will show him 1.3 million reasons why it has not been resolved. And they are still dealing with rent arrears caused by that six week wait. And bear in mind, East Lothian isn't a particularly deprived part of Scotland, although it does have pockets of poverty. On the whole, it's wealthier than the average county uh, in our country. Yet something has pushed more and more of its citizens onto the goodwill of friends and families, or the charity of food banks, or the tender mercies of credit companies, loan sharks even, or indeed the iniquitous advance on future inadequate benefits. And that something is universal credit. And many of my constituents, uh, presiding officer, have paid a price, not just in money too, or in living standards, but in their health. East Lothian Council revenue staff who deal with those in debt or arrears have had, excuse me, have had to be provided with suicide awareness training for the first time. These are the real effects of the reality of universal credit as it has been rolled out today. It is something that should be stopped and fixed before these effects are seen right across Scotland. Ruth Maguire, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, presiding officer. The damage being caused by universal credit has been clear to most of us in this chamber and to many outside for a long time. It was clear in March when the Scottish Government wrote to the UK Government requesting an immediate halt to roll out over urgent concerns about how universal credit was pushing more people into hardship and debt. It was clear in June when we debated the Child Poverty Bill at Stage 1 and heard about how the Tories' disastrous welfare reform, including universal credit, is drastically increasing child poverty. It was clear at the beginning of last month when we debated Alec Rowley's motion explicitly calling for a halt to universal credit rollout and heard many harrowing stories and statistics which underline why it must be halted. And it was clear in the middle of last month too in the Tories' housing debate where speaker after speaker spoke to how their damaging Tory welfare policies and cuts, again including universal credit, have caused an increase in homelessness. The evidence gathered at committee level has also been consistent in painting a picture of a flawed and damaging system. Whether the Social Security Committee of this Parliament, of which I'm a member, or the House of Commons Work and Pensions Select Committee, which has relaunched its inquiry into universal credit rollout as a result of its enduring concerns. Outside of the respective parliaments, charities across the country, such as Citizens Advice and Shelter, have been tirelessly highlighting the severe consequences of universal credit and calling for an immediate halt. And although late to the game, I do welcome the recent news that even some Conservative MPs are prepared to publicly recognise the indefensible and entirely avoidable damage being caused by the welfare policies of their government. 
Led by Heidi Allen, who sits on the Work and Pensions Select Committee, 14 Tory MPs have written a private letter to the Work and Pensions Secretary demanding a pause in the rollout. Speaking to the BBC just yesterday, Alan criticised the hypocrisy of the Prime Minister when it comes to the rollout of universal credit, saying that her approach does not fit with her pledge to help those struggling to meet ends meet. To quote Alan directly, she said, these are vulnerable people with no recourse to savings. We should be supporting them because universal credit is about supporting people into work and helping them move up the working ladder and take on more hours. Alan also dismissed the government's advanced cash payments solution as being like an elastoplast being stuck on and pointed out that accepting the need for advanced payments also means accepting that the fundamental design of the system is flawed. And I think that's the key point, presiding officer. Those on the Tory benches would do well to listen to their colleagues' interview in full and I'll be happy to send them a link if they'd like one. Universal Credit has also come in for strong criticism from a former top government adviser, Dame Louise Casey, who's also worth quoting at length. Speaking to the BBC last week, she said, the overall strategy might be right, the overall intention might be right, but the fact of the matter is the actual delivery of it means that some people, because of waiting times before the benefit kicks in, will end up in dire circumstances. Yes, I will. Jamie Green. Uh, sorry, thank you. I uh, thank Ruth McGuire for taking that intervention. Um, can you just clarify, are you against the principle of universal credit in its entirety? And if you are against the principle of it, I haven't heard a single suggestion on what would replace it. Uh, can I say, first of all, can I remind all members they should always speak through the chair, Apologies, please? Chair. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, nobody is against the principle of a simplified benefit system that helps people get back into work. But the reality, the reality for my constituents, the reality for the constituents, some of whom Jamie Green is supposed to represent, is that it's just not working. Six weeks to wait for money when you have nothing is an impossible situation. They need to check their privilege. We're not all in a position where we've got savings. We're not all in a position where mum or dad can lend money when you start work. You have to start thinking about the reality. Principle, fine, but it's not working and it's causing harm and hardship to our constituents. <laughs> so, dire circumstances, as she said. More dire than I think we've seen in this country for years, and that has to stop. She went on to say that I think it's okay occasionally to say that we didn't get the implementation completely right, let's pause and see what we can do. But the moment everyone's holding out with, we're pressing on, we're pressing on, we're pressing on. She added, it's like jumping over a cliff. Once you've jumped, people end up at the bottom and we don't want that to happen. However, despite such stark warnings and even the threat of a Tory rebellion, David Gock speaking at Tory conference yesterday afternoon announced, universal credit is working and confirmed that the rollout will continue to the planned timetable. How arrogant, how heartless, real harm is being done here. Despite warnings even from their own MPs, from respected government advisers, from charities, parliamentary committees and this Scottish Parliament, still they're pressing ahead with a damaging and destructive rollout of universal credit. In full knowledge of the consequences of their actions, they're choosing they're choosing to push more children into poverty, more disabled people into despair, and more vulnerable people onto the streets. Are these actions the Scottish Tories are proud of, or do they have the courage to join their rebel MP colleagues, recognise the devastation being wrought by universal credit, and call on their government to halt its rollout immediately? One person who will be pleased with the UK government's decision to press on is Ian Duncan Smith, who has said that he sees no reason to delay or stop. No reason, he says. Well, as a North Ayrshire MSP representing towns and villages due to get full rollout in November, there are more than a few reasons why I don't want my constituents to be at the mercy of this shambles. I'll tell you what I see no reason for, presiding officer. I see no reason for vulnerable constituents to be left for six weeks or longer without support, forced to rely on food banks, pushed into rent arrears and even homelessness. I see no reason for North Ayrshire Council and other local services to be put under immense staffing and financial pressures as they struggle to cope with the fallout. And I see no reason for the Scottish Government to have to keep diverting taxpayer money into these mitigating what's just a disaster and leaves us standing still. 
the UK Government must stop ignoring the overwhelming evidence that shows the negative impact of universal full credit service. Um, not just in Scotland, in the UK. It's time for the UK Government to admit their mistake and immediately halt the rollout of universal credit. Miles Briggs, followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank those organisations which have provided briefings ahead of today's debate. And I want to begin by saying that I recognise and take on board the concerns regarding, regarding the rollout that have been expressed today and in recent months, including in my own region where Universal Credit has been piloted in Musselburgh within East Lothian. And I'd like to pay tribute and thank uh, Citizens Advice Bureau staff in East Lothian for the work which they've been doing to advise and support individual local residents. I visited the cab office in Musselburgh in April to hear directly about the rollout concerns and have raised these with the UK government. Many of the concerns highlighted relate to the delays in receiving benefit payments which experienced when people initially apply for universal credit and that has been raised by all members today. And I therefore welcome the fact that the UK government has acted on these concerns and this week responded to assist claimants. The refreshed guidance to DWP staff means that anyone who needs an advance payment will be offered that payment up front and will not have to wait six weeks for it, but will receive a payment within five working days. What is important is the UK government make sure any reforms to our welfare system are done with people in mind. Yes. Uh, who, who are you taking, Mr Briggs? Uh, Mr um, Arthur. <laughs> Tom Arthur. Thanks for giving way. We are all aware of the challenges and the hardship caused by the six-week week wait. Does he honestly believe that simply giving benefits on tick is a solution to this? Miles Briggs. Throughout this time, we've been hearing these concerns, and this is exactly what the UK government has now responded to. As I was about to say before I took that intervention, those of us who have met with constituents who have ex experienced difficulties with this system know this has had a number of concerns and we've clear, been clear that emergency situations for payments do indeed exist. And on these benches we made sure that that voice was heard by UK ministers. And I think it's therefore welcome that the announcement that additional, and in addition to the five week uh, payment that actually emergency payments will also be made within, on that same day that someone needs it. Personal, financial and budgeting advice will also continue to be available to claimants and local authorities, of course, can make discretionary housing payments too. And as my colleague Adam Tompkins has, has already said, the Scottish Government has used the new powers available to it to allow Scottish claimants to choose whether they want payments to be received fortnightly or instead monthly and whether the housing element of the payment is paid to their landlord directly instead of themselves. And today's debate will no doubt inform the DWP's consideration of further issues around the rollout of universal credit. As too will the concerns that have been voiced to, by UK members of Parliament from across the political spectrum. In addition, members of Parliament's Social Security Committee will also have the chance to raise these specific concerns directly with the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions when he bef appears before the Parliamentary Committee. We encourage the DWP to continue to respond to any of these issues around the implementation of the rollout as it goes forward to the delayed time of 2022. While it is of course right that elected representatives voice concerns about some specific issues around the element of the operation of... No, I want to make some progress. I took one already. It's important too that we also remember why universal credit is being introduced and the overall vision behind what is the most radical reform of the benefit system in the whole of a post-war period. The welfare, the welfare and tax credit system inherited by the UK government in 2010 was massively complicated, ineffective and confusing. For too long it's also meant that for too many people it simply did not pay to seek to move from benefits into employment. Indeed under the Labour government's old system they puni actively punished people to try to find a job. So in some cases taxpayers were facing a situation they would lose nine pounds of every ten pounds which they actually earned. It subsidises low wages as a massive cost to taxpayers, something that even former Labour cabinet ministers have admitted was never the case. And it failed, above all, to help young people to move into work. Universal credit aims to ensure work always pays as part of an integrated, responsive, modern and flexible benefit system. No, I don't have time. That provides high quality support to help people find employment. It's designed to take into account a claimant's changing circumstances. The principle behind it is genuine and broad cross-party support, as we've heard 
um, today that no one's actually talking about going back to the old system. And from that, the evidence is clear that to, to suggest that universal credit can work and is making a difference. People's, people claiming university, the universal credit are 13% more likely to be in work than people claiming job seekers allowance. They're more likely to move into work within nine months of their claim, more likely to work for more days, and are average earning more. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the UK Government's action this week to address these key concerns around people's experiences of the rollout. I urge the UK Government, as we have on these benches from the outset, to continue to engage with stakeholders, including MSPs, with legitimate concerns as we go forward. I hope we can all unite around making universal credit a success in the future and it can help more people into employment, which is surely what we all want to see in this Parliament. And I support the amendment in my colleague Adam Tompkins' name. Ben McPherson, followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. The rollout of universal credit has been a tragedy for many, not just because of the suffering and hardship that its implementation has caused in Scotland and across the UK, but because the creators of this policy have misguidedly combined and conflated a logical ambition for a simpler social security system with an illogical, ideological, right-wing austerity agenda intent on cutting budgets as the top priority, no matter what the human cost. Presiding officer, for clarity, universal credit is meant to deliver a monthly payment to help with living costs for those on low incomes or those out of work. Therefore, in principle, you'd think it'd support those in employment and positively encourage those who are unemployed and able to work. However, this has not always been the case. By frequently assuming the worst in people by default, universal credit, as it's currently designed and being implemented, crucially, not only causes unnecessary harm, but it also often undermines its own stated aim of getting people into sustainable work because its punitive framework often exacerbates financial barriers to work, preserves low pay, and causes in-work poverty. And I think we should all remember that 60% of UK households in poverty have at least one member who works. As the Social Security Committee reported last year, although universal credit may seem like a good idea, the practical implementation and how it's resourced is causing real problems. And as the DWP has reported itself, around a quarter of new claimants have waited six weeks to be paid, six weeks with no money. And four in 10 households have ended up in rent arrears only eight weeks after a claim has been made, with four fifths of these never being in rent arrears before. And as the BBC reported last week, these rent arrears created because of universal credit have led to landlords in some areas across the UK advertising properties as no UC. This is why the Scottish Government's actions to use its limited flexibilities over the system are so important. To provide Scottish recipients a choice of more frequent payments and for the housing element to be paid direct to landlords. Presiding officer, in communities in Scotland and around the UK, universal credit is causing real and significant distress. Earlier this year, the Social Security Committee, with which I sit on, went to East Lothian, where universal credit has been fully rolled out, to hear from claimants firsthand about the system. They distressingly told us about their demoralizing experiences. One person said, I'm sitting up at night, night after night, worried I will lose my house. I can't work and my great fear is homelessness. Others told us, it's the uncertainty. It's supposed to be like work, but it's not. Payments don't come on time and you don't know how much you are getting. You get told payments will be backdated, but that's no good today. I need to feed my family. Presiding officer, the way universal credit is paid means that new claimants have to wait six weeks before receiving their first payment. And in East Lothian, one out of five claimants said they had to wait two months for their payment, and there are other cases of up to 12 weeks. And although, as we've heard, to mitigate this, claimants are able to take an advance payment called a short-term advance, or, uh, but there have also been problems with that and delays with that, and we should, be, we should be mindful of that. 
And yes, we have heard that in recent days, those needing a cash advance will get one, we're being told, within five days or fast-tracked on occasion. We'll see how that's implemented. But I think, it's, and this is crucial, and other members have made this point, the United Kingdom government are only offering these advances in the form of debt. They are loans. They need to be paid back. And that is both mean and unjust. Yes. Adam Tompkins. Mr McPherson just said, um, almost welcoming the Secretary of State's announcement yesterday, that we'll see how that's implemented. Well, we won't see how that's implemented, will we, if the rollout of universal credit is halted? Ben McPherson. As I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for a halt, but if things proceed the way that they're uh, suggested, then um, I, I do hope that the, the implementation of these changes is a success. But they're not enough, because when people are in need, I would suggest, and I've made this point to the Secretary of State in Westminster, that converting sh these short-term advances into upfront grants instead of bureaucratic loans would be a good place to start with reforming the current design of universal credit. That would be the empathetic and compassionate thing to do. However, as well as practically, the problems practically with universal credit, deeper reform of the system is also required because theoretically it is wrong-headed in its present form and that is also why it should be halted. Instead of providing encouragement, it too often creates fear. Instead of being places of support, DW job, P job, job centres are too often places of judgment, suspicion and mutual distrust. And Adam Tonkins will know that is the, the clear message we've got from evidence at the Social Security Committee. Instead of reliably providing support to those in need, too often universal credit uses threats to push people into any job any job at any human cost. And then there's the cruelty of sanctions. Fundamentally, presiding officer, any continued rollout of universal credit would be foolish and reckless when so many practical problems exist, when conceptually it's so misplaced, and when in communities across our country, it's putting so many of our fellow citizens in positions of anxiety, distress, and often alarm. 24 Scottish charities have called for a halt. At least 12 Tory MP backbenchers have called for a halt. Today, in this Parliament, we must call for a halt. And in good faith, I hope the Scottish Conservative MSPs will reconsider their position and think again and be part of that call. And at the very least, use any influence they have, if they do have any influence, with the Secretary of State close, to get him to do the right thing and at the very least, press paused on this wrong-headed rollout and policy. The last of the open debate contributions is Claire Hockey. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, as pointed out by other speakers in this debate, one of the glaring flaws of the universal credit rollout process is the length of time it will take for claimants to receive their first payment, anywhere from six to 12 weeks in some instances, with Shelter Scotland advising that nine weeks is not uncommon. This exposes claimants to serious financial jeopardy. Yesterday, the UK Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, in response to increasing pressure, not least from within his own party, announced to the Tory party conference that whilst he understood the concerns, he would be pressing ahead with the accelerated full service rollout of universal credit. However, he will update advice to the DWP to ensure that claimants who require it could get advances to be paid back over several months, as we've already heard. This is nothing more than a sticking plaster approach to the flaws in the new system, which has led to a wide range of opinion calling for the rollout not just to be paused, but to be halted altogether until all the areas of concern have been addressed. On the face of it, the idea of simplifying a benefit system to a single payment may have seemed at one point in the past a reasonable idea. Integrating several benefits into one payment would remove complexity from the application and payment processes, they said. Of course, such a major change in the UK benefit system was going to involve significant IT development and a level of complexity in that new system that was not recognised by the government from the outset. The reality is that the design and implementation of the universal credit system has been fraught with issues every step of the way. And that is mainly because an important factor appears to be missing from the scope of the project. 
the lived experience of those who this significant change was about to impact, the vulnerable and the in-work poor. More emphasis was placed on making the technology work for the department than for the customer. Criticism for the National Audit Office and the Westminster Public Accounts Committee led to a relaunch of the project four years ago. However, seven years ago from the original IT project launch, problems persist and criticism is mounting on the back of the damning evidence from the pilots and the partial rollouts in a number of small local authorities, as we've heard today. Apart from the disturbing length of time claimants are expected to wait for their first payment, the housing benefit element in the UK government scheme is no longer paid directly to landlords. Claimants are expected to get the housing benefit to landlords themselves, and for a significant proportion of claimants, this can be challenging. And as a result, may have fallen, uh, they may have fallen into rent arrears and a spiral of debt. Figures supplied by the DWP themselves have shown that many of those universal claimant, claimant, credit claimants who have fallen into arrears with rent have said it was the first time that they've fallen behind with payments in their current accommodation. Some of those affected may be lucky enough to have the support of friends and family, but the same DWP figures found that around one in ten claimants turned to payday or doorstep lenders. Aside from the human impact of this, there's a financial risk to councils, as we have heard from other speakers, where a high percentage of tenants who are on universal credit are in arrears. Data from COSLA suggests that the level of rent arrears for tenants in the new system is at least two and a half times that of those in receipt of housing benefit. Some local authorities have put millions aside to deal with the impending impact of this rollout. And indeed, my own local authority, South Lanarkshire Council, as we've heard from Christina McKelvey, has had to put money aside to deal with this. In authorities where universal credit has already been rolled out, there's a significant increase in applications for Scottish Welfare Fund, crisis grants and community care grants. And this project is not just about simplifying the benefit systems. We should also not lose sight of the fact that this so-called flagship universal credit policy was introduced as part of the Tory austerity project to cut £12 billion from the welfare bill. Many new universal credit claimants will receive significantly less than they would have done under the tax credit scheme. Shamefully continuing, no, thank you. Shamefully continuing UK government welfare reforms have left more and more families throughout Scotland and the rest of the UK in crisis situations. It should not be for the Scottish Government to continually plug the gaps left by the UK government's welfare reforms or to paper over the cracks of this Tory government's mistakes and incompetence in this universal credit debacle. Nonetheless, the Scottish Government has invested over £350 million supporting low-income families against the worst of the UK welfare reforms, including mitigating the bedroom tax and helping over a quarter of a million individual households through the Scottish Welfare Fund. This Government is also committed to restoring housing benefit for 18 to 21-year-olds, sometimes forgotten when we're debating housing and benefits. And they're extending the Scottish Welfare Fund in the interim to help those in that age group who are currently excluded from financial support to receive assistance with their housing costs. The Scottish Government will also use what flexibilities they have negotiated with the UK Government over the system to provide Scottish recipients with more frequent payments and for the housing element to be paid directly to all landlords. Presiding officer, while the Scottish Government is committed to doing what it can to mitigate some of the effects of changes to the UK welfare system, the fact remains that a full service rollout of universal credit will bring untold misery to hundreds of thousands of families and individuals across Scotland and the UK. It should be halted immediately until the glaring flaws in both systems and processes highlighted by so many organisations, including charities, Scottish and UK parliamentary committees, and even Tory MPs have been rectified. Better still, devolve all welfare provision to this place because we will guarantee a Scottish security system that treats people with dignity and respect. Now move to the closing speeches. And of course, everyone uh, who was in the debate, and if I speak really slowly, we might just manage that. And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton for around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Sometimes in the governance of human affairs, we make collectively bad decisions or inadvertently through the application of social policy, harm those of our citizens that we seek to help. When that happens, it is essential that we pause and reflect. 
Now, it's quite clearly evident from this debate in the myriad of examples and heart-rending stories of people who have suffered the inadequacies of the accelerated rollout of universal credit that this has happened. We are harming people, and it's time to stop. Now, Jean Freeman rightly referenced at the top of the debate the groundswell of opposition and in terms of the continued unchecked rollout of universal credit from political parties, including some 12 Conservative members of Parliament. And she also reminded us of the problems associated with rent arrears, which can result when the housing component of universal credit credit is delayed in the switchover. The uncertainty of this leads to tenants and to a lesser extent landlords, um, it, which is frankly intolerable, a theme that was picked up by many members in this debate. Her government's commitments towards the direct payment of housing benefit to landlords in particular right an age-old wrong, or a, a wrong that was very narrowly averted, because many people in the voluntary sector have spoken to this government. I have done so personally in terms of the impact that that can have on families where drug and alcohol misuse is a factor and where families will prioritise addiction over the payment of rent. I welcome the amendments in both the names of Alex Rowley and of Alison Johnson. Mr Rowley spoke very eloquently of his incredulity that a government would knowingly plunge its most vulnerable people into poverty and further uncertainty. Alison Johnson pointed the vast accumulation of empirical evidence that now exists in respect of the flaws around the rollout. So I assure them both of the support of our benches for their amendments tonight. Now, had it not deleted important aspects of the government motion, we would have had some resonance with certain themes in the Conservative amendment. It rightly captures comments from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which reflect an approach in the pursuit of social mobility that the universal credit still holds water. And Adam Tompkins spoke in measured terms about his recognition of the problems associated with the rollout, and that's very welcome. But his party has been shown unequal to the task of rectifying those. So while I don't doubt his motives, too much harm has been done for us not to intervene in the way that the government pro motion proposes. Sadly pro for Professor Tompkins, that measure tone was dropped by Jeremy Balfour. Whilst I respect him greatly, I think he misjudged the mood and intent of the chamber. And I don't think that anyone spoke in this chamber ha had suggested that we return to the systems of the past. And that was a point made very eloquently by Pauline McNeill. That tone was recovered for the Tory benches by Donald Cameron, who gave a considered speech in which he accepted flaws but sought to talk up the positives of the universal credit. Those positives, however, Donald, um, are eclipsed by the flaws. The flaws in the process identified by all sides of this chamber have an undeniable human cost, which now casts a terrible shadow over the improvements that it first promised. And that's been measured out for us by Ian Gray in pounds and pence. I will. Stuart McMillan. I thank Mr Hamilton for taking the brief intervention. Just certainly on the issue of flaws, will he agree with me that one of the points that actually exacerbates the problem with this universal credit is when the rollout actually takes place in November and December over the festive period, which actually makes it worse for the folk, not, not, notwithstanding the six weeks plus any additional time after that? Alex Cole Hamilton. I think Mr McMillan makes a very important point about the very clunky nature in which this process has been undertaken and without any thought for the sort of wraparound issues of seasonal involvement. And George Adams spoke uh, also of the, the impact on council officials, usually encumber encumbered by political restriction, now compelled to speak out given the frustration and hardship that this system is causing and that they are having to partake in. Tensions in this debate have understandably run high, but I would be very grateful for clarification from the Minister if she could confirm her government's support for the basic principles of universal credit, as contributions from some of her backbenchers would perhaps suggest otherwise. And if our parties are to work together in addressing its impact and in tailoring the aspects of the system over which we have control, then we do need clarity here. That said, I am very grateful for the consensual attitude adopted by the government in this debate and for the intimation that they will support our amendment. I heartily welcome the announcement in February that the government would seek to split universal credit payments across households, and our amendment restates that commitment as we believe it's absolutely vital to tackling financial abuse as an element of coercive control, because research suggests that 89% of all women who suffer abuse experience financial abuse as part of that. Indeed, Engender answered that announcement by saying, 
by deciding not to endorse UK government policy, measures such as the single household payment for universal credit, the Scottish Government is supporting women's financial independence and will reduce the ability of perpetrators of domestic abuse to control their partners and their children. It's a straightforward enough proposition and we have the tech to do it and I don't think I'm being overly dramatic, Deputy Presiding Officer, when I say that a moral imperative now exists for us to make this change. Presiding Officer, I'm running out of time, but I'm heartily glad that through the most recent Scotland Act, this chamber will now be empowered in a way that will allow us to address the giant evils that William Beveridge described some 80 years ago. And with a particular Scottish response in the direct payment of housing benefit to landlords and reinstating for under 21 year olds housing benefit as Claire Hawkey rightly stated in the eradication of waiting days while applications are processed and in splitting of payments across households in an effort to reduce domestic abuse. I am persuaded that enough consensus exists across the chamber to make this work and for us to work together in pursuit of that so I offer support of these benches tonight. Thank you. Alison Johnson, around six minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I said in opening, we will be supporting the, the government motion this evening, and I'll be pleased to support the, the motions, the amendments in the name of Alex Rowley and in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Um, I appreciate that Adam Tompkins, in his amendment, recognises serious criticisms of the way that initial payments are delayed and the impact of these delays on vulnerable people. However, I don't welcome, as he does, the announcement by the Secretary of State that claimants wanting advance payments will get them within five days because he seems, as do many of his party, to believe that advance payments are the answer. Advance payments are not the answer. We have to halt the rollout of universal credit. Now, the Conservative amendment and several Conservative speakers have drawn attention to that availability and it may be welcome, it's better than nothing, but surely it's essentially an admission that this system isn't working. And Ruth, Ruth, Maguire, Ruth Maguire pointed out that the Conservatives' own MP, Heidi Allen, who sits on the House of Commons DWP Selection Committee, argued yesterday that, and I'm quoting, getting some money to people is of course welcome, but if we're essentially celebrating the fact that advance payments are increasing and will increase, that means the fundamental design of the system, which is a minimum six weeks to wait, doesn't work. And several people have referred to the, the sentence, it feels like an elastoplast being stuck on. It very much does. Um, Professor Tompkins is very fond of quoting the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, as he does on many occasions, and his amendment today references their work. That same report, however, cautions against using benefit advances, saying the widespread use of benefit advances isn't the solution to this problem as they result in an accumulation of debt. To reduce debt and destitution, people who are entitled to and in need of income support should receive it quickly. JRF recommends the DWP gets rid of arbitrary waiting days in, in universal credit. I mean, arbitrary random, a random figure plucked from the air, really have to get to grips with this as the main issue. The report goes on to criticise cuts to the universal credit work allowance and the impact on poverty. Changes to universal credit have reduced the level of support available to low income working households. So how on earth are those households going to pay back this debt? Reductions in the universal credit work allowance alone are responsible for a quarter of the projected increase in poverty among children in working households by 2020. Um, Donald Cameron insists that claimants are paid in full, but many of these claimants, the majority of these claimants, will be paid less than previously. That's a point that I can't emphasise enough. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report also goes on to say, high quality evidence shows more money directly improves child development and health outcomes, yet support for families with children is being reduced. Um, perhaps in closing, the Conservative of who is closing can explain the grounds on which they think universal credit will reduce poverty because all the evidence is squarely pointing in the other direction. If you go onto the Money Advice website and look at the way that people can claim. They have an example using a, a chap called Ben. Ben loses his job and he makes a claim for universal credit on the 15th of July. 
If he is lucky, Ben gets some money on the 29th of August. This is simply untenable and it really has to change. Um, those who are terminally ill or even more vulnerable have to wait for up to five weeks. It isn't good enough. We've heard from others about the impact of the, the Trussell Trust who are warning that more and more people are referring to food banks. Be and look at the connection between universal credit and increased food bank use. I would suggest that it's clear to see. And, you know, we're hearing that some of this is anecdotal. Well, I was having a look today at the Common Select Committee web forum on universal credit rollout. If anyone who's experiencing the rollout would like to, to contribute, it's open until the 13th of October and some of the contributions. Initial application, not easy because I didn't have access to a computer. Um, late, wrong or both, referring to payments received, leading to eviction, complicated forms, lived off food banks and £38 a week child benefit. I couldn't get through to the helpline. I was put on hold for so long, my phone batteries rang out, ran out. I got my rent element with my universal credit. However, it's paid in arrears and I got constant letters from my landlord threatening me with eviction, leading to health issues and stress. We really have to halt the rollout of this system. Thursday's courier last week, universal credit rent arrears threat to Angus Council housing programme. The authority's strategic director, Alan McEwan, has said, we build houses that people are proud to call home, but the introduction of universal credit could be one of the biggest threats to social housing budgets. There are real concerns about arrears and of course the ultimate sanction of eviction, which will lead to more people becoming homeless. So they're very anxious that their plans to build 600 new homes could be impacted. The architect of Universal Credit, Ian Duncan-Smith, has criticised the cuts to the value. Um, just yesterday at the Conservative Party conference, he said reductions made by George Osborne were part of the reason he resigned as DWP Secretary of State. Um, Jeremy Balfour, as others have suggested, no one has said the current system couldn't be made better. Absolutely no one. But if we want to get this right, if we really want to simplify it, we have to make sure that payment arrives at a proper period of time after someone has found themselves in the vulnerable position of unemployment. People are paid as quickly as possible. We don't cut the value of the assistance either. Um, the joint public issues team, including the Church of Scotland, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the Methodist Church and the United Reformed Church have come together to say that a key role of the benefit system is to provide a sound platform to allow families to regroup and cope with the difficulties they face. For many families, especially those with children, universal credit doesn't allow that stability and pitches families from one crisis to another. It simply isn't good enough. We can and we must do better. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin for around six minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Many of the design choices for universal credit reflect the concerns and experiences of the wealthier members of our society, including policymakers and politicians, and ignore the lives and experiences of those who rely on universal credit for food, shelter and warmth. That's the quote Pauline McNeill referred to in her speech from an excellent joint briefing from the Church of Scotland, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the Methodist Church, and the United Reformed Church. And I think it, it sums up precisely what I think is at the root of the problems behind universal credit. Policy designed with lofty ambitions, but with no basis in or knowledge of the real life experience of people living on social security, surviving week to week. When we talk about people living, or to be more accurate, surviving on social security, we often talk about people who are sometimes choosing between heating and eating, people who are one unexpected bill or a washing machine or boiler breakdown away from not being able to provide for their family. So how anyone can expect those families living in those circumstances to have saved six weeks income is absolutely beyond me. And Christina McKelvey mentioned the statistics that Citizens Advice Scotland have published a, a reported 15% increase in rent arrears issues compared with a national decrease of 2%. An 87% increase in crisis grant issues compared to a national increase of 9%. Two of five bureau and impacted areas have seen a 70% and 40% increase 
and advice about access to food banks compared to a national increase of just 3%, and people experiencing a significant impact on their finances and well-being as a result of that six-week wait for payment. And the Tory government's plan to continue to roll out universal credit in the face of the issues highlighted by Labour, by SNP members, by the Tory party's own backbenchers, the third sector, by churches and others, is cruel and completely indefensible. A six-week waiting time is making it impossible for some households to pay rent and feed themselves. Those who don't have the access or those who don't have the, the skills or facilities to access the internet could be excluded from fully engaging with the benefit system and administration errors are preventing claimants from accessing some or all of the income they are entitled to. A scheme which was supposed to be uh, designed to simplify the benefit system has instead created barriers and complications for claimants and the need to support individuals out with the universal credit system, for example, through crisis payments. Now, as Alison Johnson said as well and said in their amendment, there was an assurance given originally that no one will experience a reduction in the benefit they receive as a result of the introduction of universal credit. But now the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility has said that universal credit is less generous on average than the tax credits and benefit system that it replaces. And I would have to say that I agree with some of what Adam Tompkins has said and some of what he has in his amendment. The core purpose of universal credit that work always pays would be taken more seriously though if in-work benefits weren't being cut. And as Ian Gray mentioned, research we've done has shown that single parents with children are going to be worst hit by universal credit, receiving up to £3,100 a year less than they received with tax credits. A massive hit on the, any family budget and another example of Tory attempts to balance the books on the poorest. It's shameful that in Scotland there are currently 420,000 working age adults in in-work poverty and 180,000 children. Universal credit is only going to make that worse and it must be halted and redesigned. The brutal, brutal Tory welfare reform isn't limited to universal credit. The UK government has callously ignored the fact that limiting child tax credits to the first two children in a family will push another 200,000 children into poverty across the UK. We've heard specifically around the issue of that six week waiting time that that reflects people's experience of going into work, that some people take a loan to perhaps pay for their travel costs or um, the, the family expenses while they go to work. But the fact is, when they go to work, they do so in the knowledge of the wage that they will receive. They do so in the knowledge that that wage is at a much higher level than the paltry benefits that they would receive on universal credits. Those benefits that have been frozen, that support package gradually eroded year on year by that, that freeze and increase on cost of living. But, President officer, senior and backbench Tory MPs have also expressed concerns about universal credits and 12 MPs have now signed a letter to David Gock demanding a pause in the rollout. I hope in the face of overwhelming evidence and cross-party calls for a halt to the rollout of universal credit that this Tory government listens. Thank you. I call Maurice Golden. Six minutes, please, Mr Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We must make sure that we recognise and appreciate a significant point that has come from today's debate, namely that we are all in agreement over the underlying aim of universal credit, to get people off benefits, into work and out of poverty. Yeah. However, it is clear that the strength of feeling on this issue is not felt throughout the chamber. With only one Green member, one Liberal Democrat member and a mere four Labour MPs in attendance. Perhaps they're protesting in Manchester at this moment in time. Or perhaps, perhaps 
they agree with Labour MP Stephen Timms, who, when Shadow Minister for the Employment, said that universal credit is a reform which, even though it is running four years late, we still want to succeed. But the substantive point... Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin. Perhaps there are members not in the chamber today because they're back in the offices dealing with constituents' complaints and dealing with the fallout, the fallout from the brutal reforms from the Tory, Tory party on welfare. Morris Golden. I'm sure uh, uh, that uh, the Labour benches, who uh, are indeed for the few, not the many, are unlikely to be in their constituency offices at this time. I think they should be serving their constituents if they really care about this issue here in the chamber. But the substantive point is that universal credit is a simpler system that encourages work and supports aspiration. Claimants are more likely to be in work, more likely to have more work available to them and on average earn more than those claiming job seekers allowance. Universal credit is part of a welfare state that gives people the help that they need but does not trap them in dependency. Equally though, Marie Todd. Marie Todd. Does the member really believe that terminally ill people are better off working? Maurice Golden. Uh, I think that the member does herself a disservice by bringing that up. What is clear is that universal credit is delivering, that more people are earning more through universal credit than through job seekers allowance. Yeah. Universal Credit claimants are on average earning more. That means they're being moved out of poverty and that is ultimately delivering for the people of Scotland as well as for the people of the United Kingdom. But equally though, we must also recognise that there have been issues with the implementation of universal credit. And that point has been made across the chamber. The main issues have been addressed though the frequency of payments and the fact that housing benefits were not being made to landlords were both prime topics of concern. We have supported the move to change them and alleviate concerns. As we have heard, that is down to this Parliament having the ability to modify how universal credit is administered. It is devolution in action an area of policy that operates as a reserved matter but has the ability to be modified according to the motivation of the devolved administration. It is no longer sufficient just to offer criticism. This parliament must continue to offer solutions. And whilst I am pleased to see this parliament taking action to tailor universal credit to best suit Scotland's needs, it is only right to recognise that the UK government, as we have heard from Adam Tompkins, has been taking these issues seriously and looking for ways to solve problems and improve the way the system works. Just yesterday, the UK Conservative government took action on the other major cha challenge that has been highlighted with universal credit. Delays in claimants receiving payment. Now claimants can receive payments within five days or even on the same day in case of an emergency. Not only does this show that the UK government is listening to concerns, it demonstrates that implementing universal credit is an evolving process, one that the UK government is determined to get right. I was enormously encouraged to hear David Galt say that he would, wouldn't be rushed into implementing universal credit. That is a sensible approach to take. It is better to get it right than it is to do it quickly. Right, the concerns and disagreements we have are practical matters. The substance of universal credit is on firm ground. I haven't heard anything today to convince me otherwise. I'm in my last minute. Reforming a benefit system is of course not 
easy, but it is necessary. The SNP know all about issues with rollouts. Just think of the cap farm payments yeah. fiasco, yeah. for example. Yeah. In this parliament, we have a devolved administration and it is at its best when it delivers on the promise of devolution. Yeah. Let's continue to scrutinise, to engage, and where appropriate, to act so that we make sure we get it right. With a UK government determined to succeed, and a Scottish Parliament embracing devolution, Scottish claimants now have more certainty than they will get than the support they will need on time and how they need it. I urge this chamber to support them in the name of Adam Tompkins. And I call on the Minister Jean Freeman to wind up. Minister, you have until six o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking members uh, across the chamber for their contributions to this debate. We have heard from the benches behind me and to my right, real evidence, facts from members' own constituents, as well as powerful testimony from in particular, Marie Todd and Ian Gray. And we know of many organizations across Scotland referenced in this debate who have given us their strong views and their evidence, facts again, on the direct harmful and personal impact of universal credit. Increased rent arrears, increased debt, use of food banks, crisis loans. The DWP admitting that one in four of new universal credit claimants wait longer than six weeks. Half of new claimants needing a DWP loan. Nearly one third borrowing from family or friends and at least one in 10 turning to payday or doorstep lenders. Social Security presiding officer in this government's view should be there to help and support when we need it, and any one of us could need it. It should never, ever penalise or worsen an already difficult situation. But the current UK welfare system does precisely that, through system failure and political choice. Alec Rowley is absolutely right in his assertion that the uh, systemic problems in terms of excluding individuals who do not have access to or the skills to manage an entirely digital system, his uh, comments in terms of the absence of sufficient support, the fact that the phone line is a line that people have to pay for, all of that is absolutely correct. And I'm very happy to support not only his amendment, but the sentiments he and his colleagues expressed. I'm also happy to accept the amendment in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. And can I say to Mr Cole Hamilton, who did ask me a direct question, I do support a, sim a genuine simplified se uh, system that is genuinely accessible, that provides social security support, that helps people into work and supports those for whom that is not a viable option. And I also support a system that is not willfully and maliciously used to save money on the backs of those who can least afford it. That is precisely what we have from this government, UK government's welfare system. So I say, not only is that my view, Mr Cole Hamilton, but give this government the powers and we will show you how it might be done. We are told repeatedly and through selective quoting that the point of all of this is to make work pay. What arrant nonsense. If that truly was the point, you'd act to ensure the real living wage was introduced. Mm. You'd act to end contract legitimised exploitation. You'd act to end the 60% of UK households living in poverty who at least have at least one member in work. And you'd act to make sure that the IFS estimate of an additional one million children pushed into poverty by UK welfare cuts doesn't happen. So I want to turn to and support the amendment uh, offered in the name of Alison Johnson. I agree completely with what Ms Johnson said. A family making a new claim under Universal Credit Full Service will on average get a lower reward than if they'd been making that claim under the legacy system. And a recent Scottish Government report estimated that a couple with two children, with one parent working 16 hours a week, will be £1,700 per year worse off by 2021 
as a result of changes to universal credit since 2015. And let's not forget, it's the cuts to tax credits and third child payments within universal credit which have resulted in the heinous and appalling rate clause that my colleagues over here continue to collude with and deflect from. <laughs> now let me turn to the Conservatives' position. From Mr Balfour. Mr Balfour, I have to say with the greatest of respect, if you are genuinely concerned about disabled people moving into work, then you will oppose the cut to employment support allowance and you will oppose the reduction in mobility vehicles that colleagues and others across the country are facing as a result of the UK government you defend and their position. To Mr Cameron, it is a lovely Pollyanna view of the world. Take time, be patient, it'll all be better one of these days. Your UK government has known since 2013 and again in 2014 of the systemic and policy flaws in universal credit and yet you persisted in rolling it out and you continue to persist. To Mr Briggs, I am absolutely certain Mr Briggs you're a very nice man and you sounded like a very nice man. Unfortunately, you completely failed to address the central point of my resolution in terms of this government of the amendments from my colleagues on this side of our chamber, that there are systemic and fundamental flaws in the rollout of universal credit, which the UK government, which you insist on defending, refuses to address. Mr. Freeman, now let me just, turn. Just stop for a second. Uh, I appreciate you winding up and addressing members. Would you try not to refer to them as you, just refer to them as members, use the titles. You Certainly, is, is too officer. personal. Thank you. Let me turn to Mr Tompkins. I'm glad that in the Conservative resolution, support is offered to us for the choice that this government has made that we will introduce from tomorrow. Although I have to wonder how it is possible to square the support for choice in the payment of rent direct to landlords and twice monthly payments with the position that this government is forced into of paying the DWP to deliver a choice that which my colleagues in the Conservative seats support. I'm sure too that welcome is given for the clarification that both Ms McKelvey and Ms Johnson have provided on the full Joseph Rowntree position on this matter and I look forward to hearing that quoted at length in the future. But the list of organisations that members in this chamber, that briefings that have come to us that we know about from the press, from our own work in, as constituency and other MSPs, the list of organisations saying loud and clear, all the facts tell us, all the evidence is there, that universal credit should be paused and the problems fixed. That list of organisations with more direct experience than I or I suspect just about anybody else in this chamber. That list of organisations and that evidence is to be ignored in the Conservative amendment. What arrogance, presiding officer, to ignore that. I cannot understand what the rationale can be for ignoring all of those facts and all of that evidence. We can't say that you don't know so I assume it has to be a choice. A choice like every one of the four UK Secretaries of State have had, a choice to act, to act on the evidence, to fix the systemic and policy failures of universal credit. Every one of them has failed that test. Every single one has made the political choice to ignore the human catastrophe they are creating. So now for us, as this parliament votes, to demand the UK government halts the rollout of universal credit, the question that I have to ask is direct to my Conservative members, my colleagues. What political choice are you going to make? Will you act on the evidence you've heard here today and elsewhere? Ms. Or will Freeman. your party come first? First before the needs of people in Scotland, people you are sent here to represent. Are you so thorough to your collusion that even in the Ms. face Freeman, of the misery please, that's being caused... Would you please not use the term you in this chamber? Refer to, refer to members by their titles or their full names.
or will members on the Conservative benches, members on the Conservative benches, join us and demand the UK government halts the rollout of universal credit and fixes the systemic and policy disaster it has created? Thank you. That concludes our debate on the rollout of universal credit and we'll move straight to decision time. There are five questions and I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Adam Tompkins is agreed, then all of the other amendments would fall. So the first question is that amendment 8036.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend motion 8035 in the name of Jean Freeman on the rollout of universal credit be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 8035.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes 23, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 8035.4 in the name of Alec Rowley, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of the Minister. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast those votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Alec Rowley is yes, 75, no, 23. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 8035.1 in the name of Alison Johnson, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jean Freeman. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 8035.1 in the name of Alison Johnston is yes, 75, no, 23. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the next question is on amendment 8035.3 in the name of Alec Will Hamilton, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jean Freeman. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to our vote and members may cast those votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes 75, no 23, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore agreed. And our final question is that motion 8035 in the name of Jean Freeman on the rule out of universal credit as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 8035 in the name of Jean Freeman as amended is yes, 75, no, 23. There are no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Marie Todd on the Garavalt initiative. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.